Okay, I will call this regular council meeting to order. <coughs> please stand for the pledge. Brandon, would you lead us in the pledge, please? Yep. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Can you remain standing for a moment, please? Heavenly Father, in Matthew 5, Matthew tells us that the Lord wishes us to follow the letter of the law that he gave us. And the word of the Lord stays the same, yet over time we seem to stray from that word, forming it and shaping it to our own liking. <clears throat> Making the right decisions are not always easy, as many here will attest to tonight. I'd like to personally thank Mr. Timothy Hicken for his time served on council, his contributions and dedication to this city. He will be missed as a councilman. And also for making, and, and Tim, for making the tough decision to follow the letter of the law, which obviously was probably one of the hardest decisions he has ever had to make stepping down from council. Lord, tonight give us the strength to make the right decisions, follow the letter of the law, and Lord, bless all of us this evening, and we ask for all of this tonight. In your holy name, amen. amen. I'm sitting in for um, Kathy Hoskinson, who's having surgery tomorrow. Our, our clerk of courts, our council clerk, I mean, is uh, Jessica Combo, who is uh, uh, 9 to 5 during the week, our uh, administrative assistant. So, Jess. Uh, good luck tonight, and uh, could we have a roll call, please? Mm -hmm. Carter? Walther? Here. Everson? Here. Barstow? Here. Hanshire? Here. Lee? Here. Okay, we have a quorum present. Uh, first thing on the agenda is citizens' comments, and we have a few folks that we've uh, put on the agenda to uh, give us their presentations. I know Mr. Weaver from Local Waste Services. I hope you're not here for... Well, won't matter if you're here for to uh, discuss or give us your input on, on our trash services. You're certainly welcome to do that. Mr. Weaver, who is from Local Waste Services, uh, called and said he has the flu. Um, so that wouldn't be a good decision anyway. So um, um, and we're trying to catch him in his, in his best behavior anyway. So uh, we'll move on to uh, uh, Denise Brooks, our program administrator from Licking County Soil and Water has a short presentation. Hi Denise, how are you? Doing well, how are you? Good. I'll need your name and address just for the record please. Mary Denise, Nimbley Brooks, Looking County Soil and Water, 771 East Main Street, Suite 100, New York, Ohio, 43055. Um, so a few weeks ago, I was contacted by uh, John Holman, who has a preserved farm on Mill Street that the Looking Soil and Water monitors annually um, because it is in an Ohio Department of Agriculture farmland preservation program. Um, and he let me know that there was a rezoning that was under consideration and asked if I could weigh in and take a look at the area and how that might impact the existing preserved land as well as the landscape as a whole. So as the soil and water, we're looking at ways to take care of the soil and to take care of the water. These parts of nature, that's our specialty. Um, and the land that is in the region for rezoning is interesting because there are two natural waterways flowing through it. Muddy Fork is a named one, and then there's a small tributary of Muddy Fork as well. Um, and looking at the site, the area, I was pleased to see that a lot of it is already forested which that's definitely a more resilient habitat that we like to see. The property that the Homans have is um, about 170 acres of preserved farmland, and as that program is set, that land is to be farmed in some fashion in perpetuity, forever. So it's forever farmland. It doesn't have to be the exact same operation as today, but regardless of who owns that property, who has the deed, that easement goes with the property. So we have this nice chunk of 170 somewhat acres. We've also got the Park District property and city property all in that area. So you guys have a really great opportunity to have a, a little 
collection of preserved land, and especially land with waterways in them. Um, part of the property for rezoning is in the FEMA floodway um, and floodplain area, so that's always an area that we can't develop in anyway, um, for obvious reasons. Um, what we're seeing at Soil and Water is a tremendous increase in calls of people looking for help with drainage. Like, how do you make the water go away? We haven't figured out how to stop the rain yet, but we do know that we're getting these significant rainfalls so that our floodplain maps and some of our modeling aren't, they just aren't working the same way anymore. So we're trying to be a little more um, um, open to expanding those zones of no development. We, are, we always are recommending at this point minimum a 50 foot buffer um, outside of the floodplain because we're seeing waters move further outside of that. It's something to keep in mind with this property because the floodplain is on part of the property and near the edge of the other um, part of the property. We're even seeing in some places the 75 foot buffers, an extra safety space if those buffers are in place. So when I say buffer, I just mean we're not building on it. Um, the preference is forested, shrubs, something like that. But um, it, it limits the size of the lot that you can actually build on. That's a recommendation we make because it's a lot easier than after the fact trying to help someone take care of a property they have that just won't drain for what they built in that space. Um, so something to keep in mind as you're looking at rezoning those properties. I did take a, a kind of a tabletop evaluation. I looked at the site over time in that area to see where the water lays naturally. And it, it's a wet space. I did a soil evaluation that's got some pretty significant limitations for building on. Limitations doesn't mean you can't do it. It means you just are going to fight nature and work harder to get what you want. Um, but I, I'm not sure that the whole site is really ideal for trying to have your beautiful home, lawn, space like that. Um, in terms of what I can offer the soil and water is we are looking for allowing the natural systems to take care of themselves. Having more soil for land, for rainwater to soak into it is important. I know I've done some um, technical assistance calls that are downstream from this site, areas of Muddy Fork and South Fork as well, folks looking at how, how do you help put the drainage on my property, the land's just not draining, um, something's flooding, that sort of thing. For the most part, the city is, is not a well-drained city, that's nature. Um, but we want to keep that in mind, just as we're, we're developing and we're growing and figuring out how um, this space happens to be somewhat um, to very poorly drained. It is, however, when I've dug into the soils, some prime farmland and some farmland of local uh, concern. Like it's a special type of soil. All soils have their own special characteristics, but one that's really particular to this area um, that is currently farmed. The site and all around there is, is farmed. So there were some things that I took into account as I looked at this site. Um, it, it, it works as farmland. Parts of it could work for residential, um, not sure all of it. And also talking with the park district for their land, looking at how could they have better access to that property back there. It's really special to have park land, but what's the point if you can't get to it, if you can't access it? Um, so looking at what options would work well for the site, um, I did put together a full soil evaluation for the site, things to consider in terms of what it, um, is good for what it may not be good for according to the Department of Agriculture's web soil survey. Um, but things that came up regularly were um, poorly drained, frequent flooding and ponding. Um, and obviously nobody wants that to be their home site. Um, but there are spaces on the site as well that would be moderately well drained, kind of the typical um, a reasonable residential space. Um, about a minute left. What was that? Yeah, about a minute left. No problem, thank you. Um, but I, I, one thing that did stand out to me when I looked at the soil evaluation was all of the soils on the site were very susceptible to compaction. So once they're compacted, compressed, water doesn't flow into them anymore. And a lot of times that's where we see a lot of our flooding and drainage problems stemming from. So some things to <coughs> consider, you've got a nice riparian habitat along the stream to maintain in the site, which is an important resource just in managing drainage and flooding. 
you've got a great <coughs> surrounding adjacent preserved land, park district, city land, and the farmland owned by the Homans. Um, and then just some natural drainage limitations to consider for that site. <coughs> so I do have a copy of my assessment for the property that I am going to leave with council to the appropriate person. How far down are you Chris? Yep. Thank you. Does that have the map that you were referring to? I think the soil map. No, yes. the what the floodplain map. The floodplain map. I do have a copy of the floodplain map right, with right. me. You certainly can. It is in my bag of many, many resources. Or if you could just give us a copy, that's mm -hmm. fine. Certainly, yeah. Mm -hmm. But just wanted to provide some insight for the property <coughs> um, and and things that it offers, and maybe some limitations that it has as well. And always, soil and water is open to helping share our professional expertise on matters like this. All right. Thank you, Denise. You're welcome. Sarah McGuire, where you at? Right here. Is it that time of year already again? It is. <laughs> Keep around, but you can't For hide. the cookie walk? Oh, wait, no. No, no. <laughs> Easter egg hunt. OK. Um, everybody probably knows me by now. Sarah McGuire, 321 Mulberry Street. Um, I'm here on behalf of the Lions Club again. Um, we are gearing up for this year's Easter egg hunt. It's going to be Saturday, April 4th um, at Foundation Park again. Um, I've submitted all the paperwork and permits um, for review. And one of the things I wanted to do differently this year is um, just address City Council with um, transparency so that we can uh, make sure all our T's are crossed and our I's are dotted. So um, <coughs> one of the concerns we have is um, the ability to have the gates opened during the event. Um, I understand that there's a policy or that it was, it was a policy that the gates will not be opened for any circumstances. And um, it is something that we've been allowed to do each year. Um, and I would ask that council consider allowing us to open it just during the event. Um, it's not going to be open during soccer. Um, and the, the reasoning, our biggest reason, is that this draws a different crowd of people who aren't necessarily familiar with the park layout. And the last thing that we want is a traffic jam or um, you know, somebody missing it because they can't get around quickly enough um, to come to the event. So um, the concern, of course, is always safety for people crossing the driveway. And so I have um, confirmed with the Citizens Police Academy that they'll be able to come. And we will also have a special duty police officer there that day. Um, and I'm going to have them facilitate the gate, you know, the gates to make sure that when they're needed to be open, they're open. Um, and they can also make sure that people are crossing the driveway safely. So um, that was a big thing. Um, we're gonna have 25,000 eggs um, this year, at least. Um, I did distribute a site map. Um, thank you to Jess for your help with that. Um, so we have a site map for you to look at um, and some information. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to bring up tonight is the flyer for the candy drive. Uh, we're hoping to get some donated candy this year to fill the eggs. So. Um, our goal is 23,000 pieces of candy. Um, and there are three different locations that donations can be dropped off between now and March 6th. Um, Taskville Meats, Depot Street Coffee House, and the Friendly <coughs> Group and Banking Center. So all three of those are drop off locations. And there's, of course, samples of what kind of candy we're looking for. So. I'd like to challenge council <coughs> to help us get some get some candy donated. Um, does anybody have any questions about the event? Any questions for Sarah? Yes, sir. Sir, just a quick question. Um, I know also during this event they have some special prizes that go out to mm -hmm. some of the different age groups. Have those already been acquired? Have those been donated yet? Uh, no. We maybe you just elaborate on what they have been in the past. Sure. Yeah, we get um, a variety of things donated. Um, from like the gift baskets that you see with wraps and cellophane um, to things like kites and hula hoops and sports equipment and 
uh, bubbles and all kinds of things that are donated usually um, as kind of grand prizes. <coughs> and then we also fill some of the eggs with toys and stuff too. So. Anything else for Sarah? Yes, ma'am. Sarah, I have two <coughs> questions. Are gift cards acceptable? Um, yeah, I think, I mean, we could use those to get, to get items for the eggs. That would be fine. And it says no chocolate, but then there's a picture of a Tootsie Roll, so Tootsie Rolls aren't chocolate. Well, I'm just asking. Tootsie Rolls don't melt. Okay. Like, like your Hershey bars and Fish. stuff like that. So yeah, that's the reason. So, there will be an egg stuffing party again on March 21st. Um, last year we were able to fill all 25,000 eggs in an hour and a half with our volunteers, with our volunteers. So it truly is a, it truly is a, um, everybody roll up their sleeves and get involved and it's a, it's a, it's a good thing for the community, so. Did you let everybody know here tonight they were gonna be stuffing eggs after the Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll feed you pizza after, <laughs> so. What time on March 21st? It's at 10 o'clock at Impact City Church on the 21st of March. So. Well, I know last year we utilized the PCPAA and we filled up mm -hmm. the parking lots one at a time mm -hmm. so that we utilize all those parking spots. Mm -hmm. And it, it flowed perfectly. We filled up the last lot like five minutes before the egg hunt. It was perfect. So mm -hmm. I know we keep streamlining this. So thank mm -hmm. you for what you do. Did yeah. you have another question? I did. Just to point out, uh, at the uh, park board meeting, a couple questions came up um, during that meeting. One of them had to do with um, when exactly the gates would, would open up. I know the last, there's some soccer that's going on during uh, that day in the morning, um, and then essentially on the opposite side of the park. But I know there were a couple of things in that, just making sure that that gets coordinated. So okay. one of the reasons that the park gates were closed and remain closed was for mm -hmm. safety, for the kids' safety. Sure. Um, a lot of people were speeding through there and so forth. Mm -hmm. so my concern would be that the gates wouldn't be opened until after soccer has released and left, essentially. So, and I think I understood mm -hmm. the reasoning for opening the gates is for traffic, um, flow of traffic, parking, mm -hmm. um, for people looking for parking, being maybe at the north area versus the south area, Correct. and not being able to get through to get to open parking. Correct. Um, and having to go all the way around to get to it. So yeah. when when do you think that the gates, and, and, I, and I believe sure. the citizens, uh, police are gonna, are gonna, um, monitor the gates and then open it when it's appropriate? And the police officer and the that police we have officer. there, yes. Okay. So it's not going to be left up to the, like, the Lions Club to Correct. decide, it'll be... Correct. Okay. Yes. The registration starts at 1 o'clock and uh, my understanding from Lanier is that <coughs> the soccer should be done and out of there by then. Is okay. that correct? The older age groups will be done by 1 o'clock, but the younger age groups will, will be complete by 9.30ish, that way they can get in and start throwing out all the eggs. Mm -hmm. So that wouldn't, that shouldn't affect anything in that matter. So, so essentially the gates would be open sometime after one o'clock? Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. but I know we've got to just, we've got to. We're at one. I would assume the council's going to make a motion to do that. So um, I just wanted to get narrowed down to what exactly and who exactly would be doing that. Thanks. I totally respect the wanting to be consistent with the gates. I, I understand. Um, but again, it's just a, it's a short window of time. Uh, for, for an event that people may not know about them, so. <coughs> Any other questions? Anything else for Sarah? All right, thank you, ma'am. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah. <coughs> okay, citizens' comments. Anybody wish to speak? You have five minutes, and I need your name and your address, please. <coughs> Hi, Connie Klima, P.O. Box 991, Potasco, Ohio. I represent the applicants for ordinance number 2009-4354, the 84 <coughs> minus acres on Summit Road. Tonight is the third reading, and I would um, I request that council consider making a motion to table this matter, uh, given the fact that the archi uh, residential architectural standards have become questioned, and, and even though we would not be applicable to that, we've provided information as to how we have changed our our plans to comport mostly with that, that those <laughs> requirements. And given that, um, I think in the email you probably saw that uh, if you could, would either agree to table it or either a fourth reading and amending that we 
um, uh, comply with those um, that ordinance if it's passed uh, as we have provided in our draft or table it for uh, uh, to go back to the Planning Commission so they could redo their recommendation reconsider it uh, with also with that condition thank you thank you sir <coughs> Gary Kendall, 11254 Cable Road, Pataskala. Uh, I'm here today, I just wanted to uh, vent a little bit. Uh, and the reason is, I grew up in Lima Township, and when the city and Pataskala proper merged, I really didn't have a lot of confidence in how it was going to work out. But over the years, and being involved in seeing what's going on in the community, I, I think the opportunity <coughs> was created for a really unique setting where we have an actual older inner city, we have rural agricultural district, some uh, residential ag, and unfortunately, mismatched development of some of the property that is ag. And what really gets my attention is when we try to rezone an ag district or an ag property proper uh, to some other development, multiple homes and so on. And I think, I just wish more people would share my thinking that we should work as hard as possible to preserve our ag district because that's unfortunately what draws people here. People want to live out in the country, but they'd like the amenities of home and have lawn care service and so on to take care of a nice lawn. Okay, that's all right, uh, but I think that needs to be centralized more, clustered around the city proper, uh, and avoid converting ag property to residential property regardless of the density. And unfortunately, <coughs> the pressure is there. I understand that, and I've seen that over the years. That some of that's going to happen, but I think, I hope, and I hope that more people share my thinking that we need to make an effort to manage that more and avoid the development to the point where one day we'll wake up and we'll have houses and drainage problems everywhere, which is what will happen. And unfortunately, um, that will that will come to pass, but. Hopefully, it will be delayed as long as possible. So anyway, I just wanted to uh, express my opinion, my thinking, because uh, as I said, I didn't have a lot of confidence in how it was going to work out when it first happened in the 90s. But now I see the really great opportunity to have a nice community and have some residential development around the city, old city proper, and try to retain our ag culture and that atmosphere. and. Uh, Anyway, uh, thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gary. <coughs> Good evening. My name is Grace Franklin, 11465 Cable Road, Pataskala. Um, I'd like to talk about the zoning, agricultural zoning, the 10 acre standard, which I think, as Gary just mentioned, when we had the merger, that, that was one of the zoning criteria that got established. And it's a principle. And I'm very concerned about honoring the principle of the 10-acre zoning for residential um, homes. And I'm very concerned about a precedent that could uh, undermine that principle if we begin to make exceptions. Is there a pressing need for an exception? That's a big question in my mind. And if we do not have a pressing need to grant an exemption to a current 10-acre standard, why are we doing that? And what does that mean for the future? Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm Jurgen Pate, 3 Parnassus Village Drive in Granville. I'm a planner and I'm a landscape architect. Uh, I work on the same uh, farmland preservation program as Bernie Brush and John Holman, who reported on it last month already. Uh, I was chair of the Granville Planning Commission for several years, and I also designed the first residential planned unit development in Lincoln County. Uh, I think you have two issues, and it's basically picking up from what the previous people have said. One issue is the overall amount of houses that is difficult to control, but one way to do it is to have some people donate the land, the development right, not the land, the development rights, or else what Granville has done, they have, there was first community in the state to activate the 
uh, allowable program to buy uh, development rights. And through that program, which was passed several times through a levy, uh, they have now control over 1,500 acres which will never be developed and which will be permanently off the tag, will never be a pr burden to the, uh, to the mun municipality. Uh, donating land is, of course, the best way to do it, but it's very hard to do. Uh, when I designed my development, uh, we clustered the homes on in one area, which is the least environmentally damaging spot, and kept the rest, about two-thirds of the land, open in perpetuity. And that was turned over to, as an easement, to the Licking Land Trust. And they, in turn, control about 1,500 acres. It also will never be developed. Uh, site specifically, <coughs> this is one way of doing it. In other words, you're clustering the houses on an area which is best to be developed and keeping the areas open that are either agricultural land or whatever. And you can go one step further, which is the transfer of development rights, which hasn't been used very much. Basically, you don't take away the development rights from some parcel, but you take the right to develop and move them, guided by the community, to take them someplace else. In other words, you keep that parcel open in perpetuity, but you take the development rights and move them over where the community wants it to be. That reduces the cost of development for the developer, but at the same time, it reduces the ultimate continuous cost of the, of the municipality to maintain outlying <coughs> areas. You don't have to service them out in, in, you know, on the outlying areas. So that would be one way for the community to really be guiding where it wants to go. And uh, in a larger context, also the millennials are known to be wanting to be closer together. They don't want to necessarily have five or 10 acres. They want to be close walking distance or whatever closer together. So this is all part of it. It really puts you, the community, into the driver's seat to control where you want development to be. Thank you. Have fun. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Brush. Uh, Bernie Brush, 5530 Columbia Road. <coughs> I'll just uh, a few brief remarks. I did address the... Uh, the last time I was here. Uh, I do have at least a copy of the uh, comprehensive plan. My draft is a uh, draft of January of 2019. I'm assuming that it's either updated or maybe it's been passed or hasn't been passed. I, I, don't, I don't think so. But I was, uh, I'm, I'm looking at the two ordinances, 2019-4354 and the 2019-4256. <coughs> and at least when it has the existing zoning, uh, this is the one on uh, Muddy Fork, it shows that it's in agriculture, which is 10 acre minimum. And over on Summit Road, uh, that's in rural residential, uh, which is uh, five acre. And if it's at the cutoff line, uh, just above Cleveland, <coughs> it shows medium low density, which is two acres. So that's, that's at least existing zoning. Then when I looked at the future land use map for those two areas, the draft of 1, 7, and 19, it's got it as conservation su suburban between Summit and Mink for that whole area. And for the Mill Street, it's still conservation rural. And so I, and I'm with Andy, it doesn't <coughs> cut everything in stone that that's it, it's just a, a viewpoint, this is where we think things are going. But at least at this, whoever developed this and looked at it and had some input, they saw this as continuing in the existing uh, agriculture district or suburban uh, conservation. And I just think both of those, again, as reiterate some of the others, it becomes a drastic change once you start going from the 10 acre, this is to the two acre. It changes the character of what's there. I know they're gonna try to fix the road on Mill Street, but they're not widening mm -hmm. it. Uh, it's already pretty narrow. And it sets, it does set a precedent for the rest of the land in that area to open up. And one thing that I think is particularly uh, 
emphasize tonight is that this is still a unique area, one that has a large uh, area dedicated for agricultural use in perpetuity, also has a park district. It also is along the Muddy Fork, which is a main natural drainage and uh, corridor, uh, and also for you know future park district. And it's just using that planning tool. It's just not an area that I think should get developed. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anybody else wish to speak? John Holman, 11,015 Mill Street. Um, I trust that everyone on council has had a chance to review the uh, document from the uh, Farmland Preservation Task Force Agriculture for Tomorrow. Uh, that is a uh, document representing several years of uh, effort by over 40 people. Uh, among those people were farmers, uh, concerned citizens, developers, uh, politicians, uh, people who served in various uh, political offices, attorneys, and uh, uh, this was funded by the uh, Clean Ohio Fund it cost uh, $10,000 in public, public funds to uh, underwrite this, uh, this committee. And uh, about half of the counties in the state availed themselves of these funds uh, to address the question of farmland preservation, which, of course, has been uh, discussed in our community for many years now. So. Uh, since this represents the uh, uh, formal study uh, with input by many people and uh, compilation of data, I hope that everyone on council will avail themselves of this resource uh, to uh, get a good overview of the whole picture. Um, I uh, uh, would like to give a little history of the site in question. Uh, this has been a productive farm for over a century. It was a dairy until it was made an all grain farm about 40 years ago. And uh, three generations of the Tyler and Powell families have lived there and it's classified as prime farmland. Indeed, soybeans were harvested there in the fall. Uh, the context of the neighborhood. Uh, our farm is 217 acres under an ag easement, easement uh, for farmland preservation donated to the Ohio Department of Agriculture in 2001. There are three smaller farms, 12 acres or less, belonging to the Nice, Scott, and Crowell families, and several rural re residences of varying lot size, mostly from the 1950 to 1960 era when this was under Lima Township. When the applicant purchased this tract, they knew it was zoned agricultural. It's in an ag district and it's under CAUV. <coughs> it was productive prime farmland with a current crop. And it's partly in the defined floodplain which has already been addressed. This floodplain, of course, will likely increase uh, from increased runoff from upstream development and global warming. So I urge council to study this question in detail, both historically uh, and with an eye towards the future, and uh, to uh, deny R87 rezoning, maintain agricultural zoning. The applicant can still subdivide this tract into too many farms of at least 10 acres. The value of prime farmland for local food production for the Columbus metropolitan area will only increase considering the energy constraints and the myriad challenges to our current industrial agricultural system related to global warming. 
Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Well, we're not going to get into that. Thank you, Doc. <laughs> Anybody else wish to speak? Yes, ma'am. Uh, good evening. My name is Mary Chuplowitz. I reside at 189 Vine Street. Um, I'd like to thank um, Mayor Compton and Council and Mr. Hicken for um, addressing the drainage problems that we've had in our neighborhood um, around the library, Linda Avenue, Vine, Town Street area um, that were unfortunately caused by uh, an individual um, lack of respect for neighbors. But um, I appreciate, I just want to say I appreciate and want to thank you for what you've been doing in the interim uh, to con help control uh, the situation. Uh, it is a very urgent issue. Uh, I don't know if you've driven down there when we've had rain, but there's a lake between my house and my neighbor's house. <coughs> um, and, and it's backing up all over the place. So I hope that um, you're going to look at this ordinance and, and realize it is a true emergency and would just appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else wish to speak? <coughs> Ann, why don't you get on deck? Okay. She'll speak. Yeah. Good evening. My name is Jody Bowen, 13645 Cleveland Street. I'm here to talk about SAGE. Uh, which is the proposed plan development on uh, Summit Road. To the best of my knowledge, the Planning and Zoning Commission met three times in 2019. In March, uh, in September, it was tabled, and in November, they voted to uh, that the application be dismissed. In the September meeting, according to the minutes and the uh, recorded minutes, um, the Planning and Zoning Vice Chair stated that a lot of unanswered questions about the divergences and modifications uh, still needed to be cleaned up and they had questions to be answered. If you fast forward about two months later to the November meeting on page one of the minutes and about 14 minutes into the uh, audio of recording, the Vice Chair of the Zoning and Planning Commission ask the city planner if there were any communications between the applicant and the zoning department and the city planner responded that the applicant had not reached out to the zoning staff. Additionally, during the meeting, approximately 45 minutes into the recording, the vice president of the applicant of the Sage property requested that the application not be tabled and that a decision be made that particular night. Um, one might conclude that the applicant had already made all the offers in the concessions that they were willing to make to the city at that point. The Planning and Zoning Commission had concerns about traffic, density of the proposed property, and the impact of the development and their unanswered question. One of them is the 10 acres that Planning and Zoning um, that the applicant is going to donate to the school. During the March 19 meeting and the September meeting, it was discussed by a representative of the applicant and suggested that the school use this possibly for a bus terminal with this 10 acres. <laughs> Additionally, at the September meeting, about 55 minutes into that meeting, uh, the donation, the representative of the applicant said that the donation was something that the school came up with in their three discussions with the school. So the school is asking for the 10 acres. I have concerns about that. In page 13 of the November 19th staff report, it was noted that in the original plans from the applicant that it stated that the intended use was outlined in the report. It was not in the report and was later removed from the report as far as what would happen with that 10 acres. Again, planning and zoning asked for clarity on what would happen to the future of that 10 acres. 
The vice president of the applicant spoke at the November 19th meeting. During that time, the donation of the 10 acres was also brought up again, and the vice president of the applicant said that that was what the school wanted, and that he knew that there were concerns about the ownership and long-term maintenance that was not, but that was not the problem of the applicant, that that was a problem of the city. I respectfully ask that you review the hard work of the Planning and Zoning Commission and that you ask you to uphold the, their dismissal of the application, not to table it. <coughs> Thank you. And in my opinion, this proposed development does not advance the general wel welfare of the city or the immediate vicinity. Additionally, I believe a development of this size will burden the existing street network. And finally, I am more than suspect and highly <coughs> concerned about the possibility of this 10-acre bus terminal in Cleveland. Thank you for your time. Thank you, ma'am. Hello, I'm Ann Rogers. I'm at 10932 Mill Street. So I'm here to discuss the 10 acre Mill Street property. And I am on the Planning and Zoning Commission. Some of you may not know that. Um, three of us voted against this proposal. Three of us voted for it. And uh, I voted no. Uh, the reason, a few of the reasons I voted no were <coughs> uh, because I don't believe that this property is good for a building as it's flood prone, it's in a flood plain, traffic problems, and because our school system is burdened. But tonight I'm here speaking as a resident who uh, will be directly impacted by this decision. I am a strong believer in property rights. I do not begrudge any homeowner the right to sell their property to any buyer they see fit. However, I do have a problem with a developer that buys a site with the sole intention of splitting the lots for profit. This developer knew the zoning code for this property when he bought it. It's his right to gamble with his money in the hopes that our city will vote in his favor. However, as you know, it is the city's responsibility to see that all residents' rights are protected. I am hopeful that all of you have driven down Mill Street taken the time to take a look at the property in question. Mill Street is heavily trafficked, even more than, uh, even more than um, it was when I moved here 20 years ago. I didn't buy a new home to get the um, scenery that I have. I bought an old home and remodeled it a little bit, made upgrades, um, so I didn't add a rooftop when I moved here. The homes, the home I live in is in one acre and there are just a few homes on this street that are one acre because the um, John Homans, Dr. Homans uh, uncle built those uh, two homes there. Um, so this is grandfathered in. There are, I don't think there are any homes on our street that are older than maybe 1980. So I didn't look it up, but you can look at them and see the design style. So it's been quite a while since we've had any new builds on our street. Um, our street, as you probably know, is an easily cut, it, it's used as a cut through street mm -hmm. to avoid broad street traffic and lights. So we get it, we use it for the same purpose, um, but it's also used as a detour for the street fair, which is, you know, I mean, we deal with it, it's fine, but adding six more homes adds about 66 more trips per day to our street, which is quite a bit for, uh, for our little street. Um, it's, it's been 10 years, I believe, since our city voted for the income tax to support our police and, and street repair. Am I right? About 10 years. 
And we're finally, and you know, I voted for it. It's great. It's all good. It's, but it's at 10 years ago, our street needed repaved. It was way up there at the top of the list. And we're just now getting to where we're getting it replaced. So adding more traffic to Mill Street, I'm hoping wouldn't add to, to the, to damaging our street. Um, the old adage, not in my neighborhood, is something I know leaders we're weary of hearing. However, um, many of our current residents and future residents want to see our street remain the same. They use it for bicycling, taking their children for walks, that type of thing. It's an ag district. Like I said, the builder knew it was an ag district when he bought it. He can build two homes on that property without any permission. Um, lastly, I want to mention schools. I know I only have about 30 seconds, but my granddaughter lived with us for a short period of time. She's, she just moved into Dublin schools, but um, she, as a kindergartner, was bused to Kirkersville. That's a seven mile drive. She was put on a big yellow bus. Then she was transferred to a shuttle bus and taken to the school. And then she was in a modular, thank you, she was in a modular unit with 23 children. So in order for her to use the bathroom, she had to memorize the code, put her little coat on, go over to the big building, punch in the code to go to the bathroom, and then come back out, go back into the modular unit. A kindergartner, I mean, the answer to the school problem is not more children and it's not more rooftops. The only person benefiting from this rezoning would be the developer, not any of our citizens. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Chair. <clears throat> Chair Zuckerman, 6368 Summit Road, here in regards to the SAGE project. Um, as we've mentioned at many past meetings, both planning and zoning and um, former council, previous council meetings, um, there's a lot of concerns. I think at this point, the biggest concern I heard today was asking to table it again. We had a lot of that at the planning and zoning. A lot of time has gone into this. The residents show up to all these meetings. You know, it's, it's taking out, takes out your time. Takes, they're not coming back with new things every time they ask it to be tabled. You know, that's what happened. Planning and zoning questions still weren't answered. I don't think we're going to get any further other than is the siding going to match the new code rather than all the other issues that we're dealing with with current, you know, the, the police task force that we have not yet increased that we need to increase, the school issues, the traffic issues, the drainage issues, and the fact that they're trying to take a property and rezone it to a cluster design when our vision for the future, which I know is not the current draft, but the current draft is at least R87. We're trying to go backwards from the vision that we're trying to move forward as a community to the suburban conservation and I think at this point I hope that you guys take the planning and zoning's recommendation to not accept the application and I'd love to see some development but I'd really like to see something a little more along the lines of uh, up on Havens and Babbitt where they have the five acre plots the ten acre plots you know adding value to our area while conserving that rural feeling in the area that it was intended. Thank you. Hi, my name is Donna Spencer and I'm here in regards to the Sage Point um, issue also. Can I have your address please ma'am? Oh, I'm sorry, 6345 Summit Road, Thank Southwest. You. I'm two lots away from the proposed um, site. Okay. Um, I just wanted to make mention to the Council of a article that was posted in the Newark Advocate a year ago um, in February of 2019 um, regarding a, a proposed um, development called Hunter's Crossing which uh, focused on 223 lots uh, which was located north on the north side of Refugee Road by the White Feather Farms um, chicken place in Pataskala um, between Mink and Summit Road um, I know that Dr. Wagner, Philip Wagner, the superintendent of the schools, had 
um, was neither for nor against the Sage Point um, project. But for this particular project, um, for Hunter's Crossing, um, Superintendent Philip Wagner appeared before council a year ago today, or a year ago this month, um, presenting charts to the council indicating a history of steady enrollment increases and further similar trend lines projecting an enrollment of more than 6,000 by 2029. Um, sharing his concern about the potential of the proposed development adding more students, Wagner said, as we look at enrollment, we have 881 potential new houses coming to the district. I have concerns about this project and others to come. The challenge I also have is our relatively high tax base. How much more can we put on residents? Um, of the proposed Hunter Crossing project, <coughs> Wagner said, this density concerns me. And he said this a year ago, February uh, 19, at one of these meetings where he presented different graphs and charts of the Licking Heights enrollment projections. Um, and then it's also noted in the article that Council Member Todd Barstow agreed Summit Road is a mess, Taylor Road and Broad Street is even worse. Um, and then another comment that was cited um, by Council Member <coughs> Melissa Carter is that we have substantial infrastructure issues on the west side of town We've become an artery from one side to the other. I don't think right now we're positioned in a way to bring large housing developments in. We have severe intersection issues that are primarily on the west side of town. So with this in mind, just written one year ago, why would we consider um, another subdevelopment, which is actually supposedly going to be built where there are already three schools and a fourth one being built on Summit Road? Um, so I, I am also asking not to table this issue and to just dismiss it and not approve it. Thank you. Hello, I'm Destiny Coleman, 6335 Summit Road Southwest. My property is located directly next to the proposed property on Sage Point on Summit Road. Um, the current Looking Heights High School is built for 900 students. Uh, there are 12 dollars <coughs> that sit outside the building with enrollment of over 1,200. By the time the new high school is built, it will already be at capacity. So adding 183 homes and inviting hundreds <coughs> of new students to the district will put us over the capacity of the high school and jeopardize our students' opportunities to learn and the teacher and student ratio and budget cuts will limit their academic success. Needless to say, the high school cannot accommodate hundreds of new students. Back in 2014, the Licking Heights School District purchased land behind its current high school in hopes of building a newer, bigger facility. However, when the Licking Heights School District asked for the use of the lot on Summit and Cable, which is now being built, built on, to be zoned for agricultural use to school use, the Board of Zoning and Appeals denied the request. According to the paperwork sent by Dr. Wagner, the superintendent of Licking Heights, the Board of Zoning and Appeals Clerk found that the request would be hazardous to the existing of future neighborhood uses, would be detrimental to the econo economic welfare of the community, and would create an interference with the traffic patterns in the area. So the point is, if the Board of Zoning felt that way about building a new high school further down the road on Summit, wouldn't it still be an issue in building a 183 home mm -hmm. property that is so close to the three schools that already exist on Summit Road and Broad Street with terrible traffic patterns that happen every day that we mm -hmm. have a two lane road? So currently it is nearly impossible to get down Summit Road to Broad Street during the mornings and in the afternoons due to those pickups. And so I ask that you do not table it tonight and that we do not approve Yes. Thank you. Name and address, please. You have five minutes. Hi, right, my name is Julia Robinson. I live at 210 Cedar Street. I am in favor of this development. It is far more superior to the high density type developments that we have seen. Um, this is something that I would wish to own. I can imagine myself living on a property like this. And a comment was made that it's only benefiting uh, the developer 
but it would benefit me. I'm a nurse who has spent half of my career, half of my life serving the public. And I feel like that with lots of these size, it would I would be actually to be able to afford something like this. When you would increase the lot size, it would put something like this out, out of my reach and of many others. I am for this project. Thank you for your time. Yes, sir. Yeah, Pete Holmes, 6234 Summit Road, addressing a, a rezoning on Summit Road. And um, I'm against it. One of the biggest concerns is the infrastructure, which is Summit Road. There's no left-hand turn lanes, for instance, from Morris Road to Broad. So the addition of 184 houses, or 83, whatever, you know, uh, just seems like such an overload. There's no shoulder. It's not very wide, and it's just tar and chip most of the time. So that's a huge concern. <clears throat> I also agree with Jody that you would really uh, carefully respect the zoning commission's advice of you know uh, not allowing the rezoning. The density is just too high. That land has a lot of drainage issues, as you probably already know, and um, you know just the uh, you know the police are going to be burdened. Where they're already asking for money. It sounds like coming up to the next election with the levy, and um, so I, I also agree with my neighbors that we shouldn't table it, and we should turn this uh, rezoning down. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, <clears throat> Ryan Lammers, 110 Ashley Lane, just up the road on Summit from the Sage. Uh, I'm here, same as most, to say please disapprove it and follow the zoning recommendation. Um, for the same everybody else is covered, but just to look forward for the city, a lot of what this subdivision is offering, they're not putting in sidewalks, and this is a lot of what happened on Taylor. Subdivisions came in, slapped them down, plan or plan PDD, plan development, and now the city then had to turn back around and put in sidewalks and bike paths and stuff up there this area would be turning around having costs for the city in the future to do all this uh, repairing the roads it, it'd be a lot of cost for the city even though it would be producing some tax income and i just strongly advise against it uh, one other small thing just the road sizes that have been continue to get put into these subdivisions are too small i work for columbus fire um, columbus fire is going to be responding with West Licking here when they open Station 35. With that, a lot of the responses we have in these communities, the roads are too narrow. And you have parking on both sides of the street. One person parks a little bit off the curb, we cannot get the fire apparatus through. The cul-de-sac circumferences are too small. You know, they, they meet a minimum standard when there's no cars parked there. And then when people have their cars there, their trash cans there, that really becomes an issue for us responding. And when you do look at these, I just highly recommend to follow the zoning that is proposed. Um, when I bought my property, I looked to the future planning that was set forth, looking at what would be built around me. I tried to do my due diligence. Thank you. When does the Wagner Road Department open? <laughs> Soon as stat, um, hopefully within a month or two. There's still some minor work being done. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Phil Urso, 6774 Columbia Road. Um, so I'm located just north of the intersection of Mill Street and Columbia. Um, no one has even brought up Columbia Road, which is one of the main access points to this area. Um, that four-way stop is kind of dangerous already. A lot of people ignore the, that, those stop signs and go right through them, especially at nighttime. Um, the other access points uh, from Mill Street and 310, that's another very dangerous intersection. It's just poor visibility over there. Um, you know, the road condition on both Mill Street and Columbia Road are both um, in need of being fixed and widened. Um, so I don't see that happening. So there's some strong <coughs> concerns about um, 
really all four access points from Columbia Road and Mill Street going into this area. Um, so the increased traffic would be concerning. Okay. Thank you, sir. Hi. My name is Brenda Colson. Me and my husband own at, and I doubt anybody remembers this, it'd be a Bessie addition in Summit Station. And it actually butts up to the property. We own three lots. Um, right now, can you give me one of those addresses for the record? 35 Broad Street Southwest, okay. which Pasqua doesn't know where it is. <laughs> so um, we had a you know post office box for many years, but we couldn't get um, mail delivery without having a Pasqua address. So for, we've been fighting Pasqua for four or five years now, trying to get our mail. So, but anyway, we own three lots right there um, that butts up to this property with the Sage Point or whatever. I have one lot right now. It's totally, completely flooded. It all comes from that property there. Over the years, we've been there 25 years, and over the years, um, it's flooded, I don't know how many, how many times, because it's nothing but a flat plateau there. There's nowhere for drainage to go. Um, but our big concern is, and we've had kids in the school, uh, you know, for the past 25 years. Um, the more traffic, uh, we sit there and listen to the sirens go by from all the speeding and the high school kids and, you know, just the two-lane traffic as it is, is very bad. Um, like I said, we spend a lot of time sitting at our back window and we can see the wrecks just coming around that one S curve. Mm -hmm. Um, and then since the new uh, development on the, on the left side of the road, or you know, going north on the left side, on the new development, um, since all that traffic has come into play, the roads aren't taken care of, there's no shoulders. I sat down this evening and tried to figure out pros and cons to each one of these. Who's benefiting from this? Mm -hmm. it's, not the, it's not the property owners in that area. Um, again, I have three lots and they all butt up to that and one lot is always completely pretty much flooded from that uh, property. Um, to me, with new houses going in, I can see where it's a, it's a pro for uh, Pataskala or Licking County or however you want to say it as far as property taxes, as far as levies, um, the police fire getting more money. But again, I'm looking at 183 houses. I'm looking at 400 extra cars going up and down that road. The buses have to stop for the, we have plane trains and automobiles. Uh, the buses have to stop for the, for the railroad tracks. That backs up all the traffic again. You come through there at 3.34 o'clock, you can't get down Summit Road now. So to me, um, I'm not real being that we butt up to that property. I'm not real receptive to getting 180 some houses in there. I'm sorry. Um, like I said, it's very. Uh, there's no drainage. Um, <coughs> I was kind of upset when Rona come in and they put them uh, just down on Cleveland Road. They put the trailers in. It's not supposed to be zoned for trailers. I tried to get a trailer on the, one of my lots for my mother, and it was turned down. But yet. Rona got a whole trailer park right down the road. So I'm not real receptive to a lot of things that I've seen go on in the last 25 years, and I'm definitely not receptive to the 183 houses going in. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. I'm sure there's a lot of people who've moved out here Can from your, the years. Can I have your name and address first, please? Uh, Jack Neville, 13500 Cleveland Road. Thank you. It's on the station. I'm sure there's a lot of people that moved out here over the years for peacefulness in a nice rural setting right there. Uh, please don't turn. To, uh, Summit Road can't handle the traffic that they're wanting to dump on this with the new school. I have followed people where the berms was hanging a foot right off into the ditch. They didn't call the task, but please, they called the uh, highway patrol right there. The road can't handle it right there. Now, um, well, I forgot what I was going to say right there. Uh, where they moved out here for a, a good, peaceful setting. I'm just saying, please don't turn this into a little Columbus, a Reynoldsburg, or a Gehanna. You take one 
How's the development here? Another one here? Another one there? Another one there? It's gone. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Name and address? You have five minutes, sir. Jonathan Scott, 10729 Mill Street Avenue. Um, I, I've talked to this council a couple times, and I'm not going to go repeating every single thing every single time. It's just not worth it. Um, I do want to bring up a major point, actually, that happened uh, two nights ago um, when I was in my front yard. Um, as we all know, the, the two uh, very nice bumps that are <laughs> located right between mine and Don's house, um, the traffic is getting worse. The gentleman was going about maybe, I would say about 70, maybe 80 miles an hour, hit the top of that hill and almost hit me when he lost control when he landed and nearly went creaming into my truck right next to where we have our little light post that refuses to work no matter what I do to it. Um, the other thing too is the water. And I know I've mentioned this over and over again, but remember this, my neighbor and mine and me, both of us have the, you know, the little creek running straight through both of our properties. Doing anything with those property, that property over there that changes that creek in any way or shortens it or thins it out, it doesn't drain. It does not, once that water starts flowing, it backs up and literally takes up maybe, I would probably say about an acre of my entire land. Last time we had a heavy storm, it actually went almost all the way up to the road. I think uh, when me and uh, Ronnie and Pate were all out there, I think it was less than maybe an inch and a half from cresting the road. And that was before, that was before the new culvert, but even with that new culvert, it's not going to stop that much water. There's just too many properties that flow straight into there. Plus, not to mention, even my pond is fed from two underground streams and John Holman's pond that's on the backside of his property, which uh, goes past, uh, goes right through uh, Carl Rochon's property, where Brian and his uh, family are uh, running right now. They, there is multiple different feeds from every different direction. I have, I can actually show you next time it rains if you, you're more than welcome to come out and see it for yourself. My pasture, where we had our horses, thank God they're not there now because I, I couldn't stomach having to fix that again. <coughs> but one side is completely covered in water every single time it rains, no matter what I do. We actually have to dig down four feet and actually do a new plenum all the way to my pond just to get it to where we can actually even walk on it without sinking a foot. Hmm. On the other side of my property is two underground springs right off of Don's property that feed directly into the back side of my property, uh, which the holes are actually right there, um, right on the other side of my fence line. You can Anybody can see them any time of year. Uh, the only time is, is when the hydraulic pressure underneath the ground gets high enough, that's when they start flowing. So most of my property is underwater. Even right now, my property is and about, I'd say about a quarter acre is actually underwater right now just because of the, the ponding where the field meets my property. That part I'm okay with because honestly, I've learned to deal with it over the, over the year that we've been here. <coughs> but any changes that we make are going to directly impact every aspect of these houses. And I do agree, I say, you know, that they should be able to build, but I do believe that we should keep it agricultural do two properties since we already know that in the future they do plan on doing the four plots uh, directly across the street which you know if they're 10 acres I, I, me and my wife discussed it and we would accept that but I believe that introducing that many houses is going to create too many problems and too many unknowns and it's not going to be the it's not going to be country time but country time is going to benefit they're not going to there's not going to be anything wrong it's going to be the people who buy those homes that are going to suffer from those consequences thank you thank you all right. Um, Name and address: you got Mark Graham, 671 Heidelberg Court, Northwest Lancaster, Ohio. Uh, talking regarding the Mill Street rezoning. Um, try to talk relatively quick. I'm trying to. Uh, been trying to listen to all the comments and try and get information to you guys to address those those kind of comments. Um, it was mentioned, I guess it's been brought up quite a bit about the floodplain. I don't know if 
you guys all have a copy of the map showing the floodplain. Um, I've got seven copies here. But you'll see that the uh, um, Muddy Fork Creek actually is not on our property. Uh, you know, it, it's behind us. Uh, it, it's in the park's property behind us, and there was talk about having a riparian area between, you know, the creek and, and the open area. There is forested riparian area already there. It, it's kind of protected. Um, as far as the floodplain goes, there's there's been a lot of talk about floodplain on our property. Uh, there is about a half acre of our 21 acres that's in the 100-year FEMA floodplain and just a little over an acre of the entire 21 acres that would encom be encompassed when you take in the, uh, what FEMA is predicting as the future potential 100-year floodplain and the 500-year floodplain. Uh, I, I know there's a lot of drainage issues with some of the people in the area. Um, this property is not necessarily one of those. Uh, the, you know, we actually have really nice drainage outlets that we do back up to this property that has the creek. You know, so on all of our properties drain deck towards that creek. Um, we've talked about we have one little ponding spot that that on that lot. We've we've been going out and getting individual soil testing done, make sure that the lots are viable. Uh, we'll have to do that to get these lots approved. They have to be approved by the health department. Uh, talking about the soils, um, you guys will have a copy from the soil and water office on the soil map of the area I'm talking about. Um, there are some soils on the property that aren't great, uh, but 54% of our property is composed of Cardington Silt Loam. Uh, Cardington Silt Loam, if you want to look in the soil report, or we have the soil report, it's, it's not that bad. Uh, it's actually uh, described as moderately well-drained. So 54% of our site is moderately well-drained. We're only trying to do five more homes than we would be allowed to do. So seven homes totally on 21 acres. You know, we've, we've got a lot of room. And the uh, property actually does drain well. It has a nice roll. I know the gentleman was talking about his property abutting that stream, and he has a lot more flooding in his fields. Uh, he, his property is in the Bennington soils. You know, our, ours are the Cardington soils, if you want to read the soil report, talking about that kind of stuff. Um, we're, and when you talk about suitability to building and you look at the soil maps, um, it's a little it's a little extreme if you go by the USDA uh, Web Soil Survey because it actually shows you know uh, poorly suited to to building and this this is the entire Lima Township what used to be and when you run that map on the entire Lima Township. The entire thing is in what's classified as poorly suited, generally to, to building. Um, and actually, the soil type that is 54% of our property is the same soil type that this building is built on top of. Okay. Um, there was uh, let's see access to the parks. We the park had a meeting. They are not in opposition to this rezoning. Uh, they actually do have good road frontage, that it's not a landlocked piece of land. They have good viable road frontage and area to park you know, on their property. Um, uh, it was mentioned that our property is in CAUV and in a crop. It was in a CAUV and in a crop last year. We've removed it from CAUV. Uh, and actually, and there's not a crop in now. Uh, we're, you know, our taxes have gone up dramatically and when we finish doing what we're going to do, the tax base generated for Pickerington will go up dramatically compared to that 21 acres in CAUV. <coughs> so we'll be paying a lot more taxes. Uh, okay, it was mentioned about people wanting to see development like the Havens Corners area. Uh, we developed Havens Corners, the corner up there, two and a half acre to eight acre home sites. And it seems that there is a big demand in this area for that type of home site out in the country. Okay. Um, Oh, my timer went off too. All right, thank you guys. All right, thank you. Anybody else wish to speak? I'm Susan Holmes. I live at 6334 Summit Road. <coughs> this is in regard to the Sage Point development. Um, I think everybody here is 
pretty much said a lot of everything that I'm going to say, but uh, most everyone wants the comprehensive plan to stick to it. As a community, we don't have the roads, the infrastructure, um, you know, the taxes, the police, everything um, is being stressed. The zoning board voted this development down for good reason due to the facts, <coughs> too many divergencies, incomplete information, and unknowns. <coughs> I ask that you listen to them and follow the comprehensive plan. R87 is one unit per two acres or 42 homes for the site, not 184. Um, if they wanted to go in and develop 42 homes, that would be acceptable to our community. Traffic study did not look at Cleveland Road. With There is no dedicated right of way in Cleveland. If you talk to the engineer, I just talked to him today, Licking County, <coughs> the poor intersection at Cleveland and Summit, and the poor circulation. At Route 16 and elementary school, the railroad crossing, the four way stop at Haven's Corners. This all needs further study before you consider putting any higher density into that area. A school development on Cleveland without proper roads is negligent. Um, that road just isn't sufficient. A housing development with 183 homes will average two to three cars and approximately 366 to 540 nine more cars to the area. This does not include any other future developments down the road. The zoning board member, uh, Andy Rogers, vis visited the area and stated it was a mess for traffic at the school. Many kids walk during nice weather and there are no sidewalks on some of these areas. Um, last meeting, I think it was discussed that many of the HO, this is gonna be put into the HOA, have problems which turn into the city's problem. We don't need additional burden and stress on taxes. The police services, like we have already talked about, are currently stressed, and more tax levies are looming. We know that changing this property to a higher density will set a precedent for neighboring properties. There's hundreds of acres that are around us that are owned by LLCs that are probably going to be in line to get their zoning changed as well. As community, we need to decide to stick to the comprehensive plan and keep our community as it is. Thank you. Anybody else wish to speak? Clark Williams, 10914 Mel Street. I don't have any more information than what you heard. I just want my voice heard that I was against the Mel Street uh, rezoning. And that's all. Thank you, sir. Anybody else wish to speak? Is it possible to make another comment, please? No, sir, not tonight. Well, you'll have a chance at the end of the meeting. We'll have three minutes to talk about any topic we've had tonight. So, yes. Cool. Yep. Just not at this time. Anybody else wish to speak? Good evening, Your Honor. Gentlemen and ladies, Kenneth Hoying, 302 Eden Dairy Lane, Pasqua. Uh, I grew up uh, in a rural area in Shelby County, Ohio. My parents were farmers understand the process of that. I lived in cities my whole life. Uh, I understand the process of that. I understand the process of growth. I live in the northwest corner of uh, Pataspa in the Commodore subdivision. I was the first homeowner there. I love every bit of it. Uh, that being said, um, I anticipated that that whole region was going to kind of stay developed in that aspect of it was. Two acre lots, large homes, somewhere where you can get behind, raise your family, your kids don't have to worry about cars and traffic and so on and so forth. I understand that they can't control everything. So uh, my progress, or my, my comment on this, uh, this uh, proposed <coughs> development on Summit Road just north of Summit Station is more of an infrastructure, not so much the farmland or, or anything like that or the agricultural aspect of it, but Summit Road is not safe, period. Uh, I'm a contractor by trade. I love progress and building and things like that, but it's got to be done right. If I'm a plumber, I'm not going to run eight two-inch lines into a 12-inch pipe. And that's kind of what Summit Road is right now. Everybody wants to go north. They want to get to 161. Uh, you got Graham Road, you got Wagner Road, Summit Road, Mink Road. Everybody's going north to get to 161. The majority of the traffic on Summit Road is not by anybody that lives on Summit Road, whether they're going to school or they're beat, beaten north, going into town. Okay, so I think that's a big problem. Um, 
on my way here, I found out about this meeting late, so I apologize for my lack of preparedness. On my way here, I stopped uh, just north of the school project in uh, Chuck Carrier's driveway, if you know where that is. And <coughs> he's got a culvert that runs through a creek on the north side of the property, right at Summit Road. And I got out and I measured the depth from the road to the bottom of the creek, and it was six foot. Okay? That's a one pound tape. Imagine a three pound bus getting pushed off the side of the road by a car going left to center on a narrow road. Mm -hmm. Imagine the deer that are now displaced because of the school that used to cross the road in a certain spot. Okay? We can't predict what's going to happen. But my problem is with this. We have to fix the problem of the road before we put new cars onto it. Uh, I looked online right before coming here. And uh, City of Pataskla as of uh, January of 2017, uh, number of residents with more than two cars. Two cars was 44%. Three cars, 17%. Four cars, 8%. So if you're going to put this neighborhood anywhere on Summit Road, you got to realize you're probably going to get two cars per household. So that's about 160 cars daily you could potentially be putting on the road. You have to fix the problem of the road before you let anything go in. Also, I don't know how many of you folks travel Summit Road. There's not one guardrail, not one guardrail from Broad Street to Morse Road. And you got a six foot ditch. <laughs> That's a bad hazard. So fix the problem before you add to it. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else wish to speak? All right. <clears throat> Let's see here. Now we're going to move on to, uh, oh. Here you go, Mr. Uh, Council President. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so the first thing we have up uh, is interviews for the Planning and Zoning Commission. I think I was notified before the meeting of Mr. Glorring, who had um, applied, was said the problem with work could not be here. So we have Mr. Cook. I thought I saw Mr. Cook here. There he is. Um, so Mr. Cook, if you come forward. Give us your name and address, please, for the record, sir. William Cook, 419 Oak Meadow Drive. Tell us, like, tell us why you'd like to be on the Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, I'll, I applied for both the Planning uh, and Zoning Commission and the uh, Zoning uh, Appeals Board. Given the choice of either one, I prefer the Zoning Appeals. But uh, I applied for both simply because I'm interested in being a, uh, on one of those boards and would like very much to uh, serve the city, and that means one of those two boards. Does any uh, council member have any questions for Mr. Cook? And let's uh, do this. Mr. Cook is here, and he's the only applicant for the BZA, so does anybody have any questions for him in reference to either one of these positions? I actually have a Mr. He Mr. Evers. Um, Mr. Cook, thank you for applying. Uh, for both, uh, it's nice to see uh, the citizens taking a, an interest in the way the uh, donuts are made, so to speak. Um, uh, my question is with variances, um, what's your opinion on variances and are variances something that should um, always be considered or is it something, you know, do you lean more towards how it is right now and how the zoning is written? Uh, two years ago, I applied for variance on my property on Oak Meadow because I was uh, wanting to put addition on it. It was encroaching into the 35-foot uh, backyard measurement. And it was approved. And um, I'm very glad it was approved. Uh, to answer your question specifically, I think the zoning variances have to be apply uh, looked at one at a time. There is no blanket yes or no. It's just simply what, what each individual one requires. And also, if I may ask, um, uh, what is the reasoning for your preference for um, zoning the field versus uh, the commission? It just seems like to me that that would be a more fitting position for my uh, my qualifications. Yeah, could you elaborate? Well, I've uh, I've 
spent 35 years as a firefighter, uh, 27 of which I was in Whitehall and rose to this uh, rank of uh, assistant chief and I acted as chief for six months. Um, that gave me a, a lot of experience in the, uh, the whole issue of dealing with um, variances and uh, just the whole issue of, of oh, what's the word I want to use? Uh, just dealing with people, dealing with the necessary things that need to be looked at to, to look at those qualifications and see what, what would work, what would work, what would be safe, what wouldn't be safe. And that's pretty much it. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Anyone else have a question? Mr. Walker has a question. Mr. Kirk, thank you uh, very much for your persistence, first of all. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm anxious for you to be on a uh, on a one of our boards, uh, whichever win if you pref have a preference, um, obviously. But in the um, in the planning and zoning commission, um, you know, you've obviously you've heard tonight uh, about two different uh, subdivision yes. um, uh, applications, totally different end of the spectrums. Yeah. Um, and with your experience with Whitehall and other areas that you've lived in, how do you how do you view these these completely opposite <coughs> arguments essentially that we've heard this evening or com concerns that we've heard this evening you know one for small lots one or one against small ones lots one against large lots H how do you see that and and remedying that if you were on planning and zoning and I hate to put you on the spot but I know you've had you've been thinking about it I'm sure yeah, yeah, you've been <laughs> sitting out there um, actually um, again from my own experience when we bought the house on Oak Meadow we spe <coughs> specifically looked at a small lot uh, for maintenance purposes, but we were, we looked so consequently we looked in a pre-developed area that had small lots. Uh, hindsight being 2020, at this point in my life, I, I'm kind of not happy with the fact that we did buy a small lot. So there's there's it's it's two-sided story, and it could go either way. The the uh, the bigger lots I'm, I would want to look at, as opposed to the smaller lots in a in, you know a, a more dense area. I think, as some of the people said, in this area, in Patascala, in the new you know in the in the Patascala Lima area, it is residential, it is um, suburban, and I think it should stay that way. But yet again, you got to look at each individual thing that comes up and, and make the decision based on what the way they apply or what's going to work best in the area. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walker. Any other questions for Mr. Cook? All right, seeing none, thank you, Mr. Cook. And uh, members of council will be looking, I'll be looking for uh, motions um, at the appropriate time in meeting. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You're welcome, sir. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to introduction, discussion, and approval of consent agenda matters. So moved. Moved by Mr. Barstow. Second. <coughs> Second by Mr. Walter. Discussion? Just, yes. Just a quick discussion on the consent agenda. You'll find the uh, two motions for approval of the um, uh, um, application, ag application. Uh, both of those were uh, listened to this evening at uh, Ag Committee with no comments or concerns. We'll be making a motion later on there. Roll call, please, unless there's any other input. Thanks, Jess. Mm -hmm. Walter? Yes. <coughs> Epperson? Yes. Barstow? Yes. Hampshire? Yes. Lee? Yes. Consent agenda passes. On the reports. What do you got, Mr. Barstow? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. A um, couple things. I'm trying to find my announcement here. Leeds is having a. Uh, together. Uh, no, I can't find it in my stack of stuff. We'll come back to it. We'll come back to it. But, uh, no, just a couple of things. I, I, I want to say this. I want to comment on the, uh, on the local waste issue. <coughs> just wondered if it didn't show up this evening, uh, and no, matter what the, no matter what the reason. Um, I, I have to say, I'm going to ask the water director to look at that contract and uh, get back to you on um, what our options are for that contract in terms of uh, terminating. I have to say, I'm, I'm not pleased. I haven't gotten to the point where I'm saying, yeah, we have to get rid of them, but I'm, I'm not pleased with their customer service response. I've seen a lot of comments on Facebook and other comments. So I guess Mr. Zell's take a look at that. Um, get back to me. Not tonight. Not tonight. Of course. Um, and uh, so I appreciate
appreciate people who commented. I mean, some people may have commented. I don't think I think most folks are here for the zoning issues, but um, I've seen a lot of uh, slot issues than I have. So that's uh, that's my two cents. Thank okay, you, Mr. Mayor. Very good, Mr. Zetz. I have nothing. Thank you, Mr. City Administrator Chris Sharrock. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I've got a couple things, uh, follow-ups to the last meeting. Um, the, I did get a hold of AEP and put in a request for a um, cost estimate on relocating the power pole with Mill and Main Street, but I've not heard anything back yet, so uh, that's, that's in the works. Um, the concern of CS Electric doing the uh, transition for the new electric lines, uh, they got a schedule from uh, Mr. Peters with CS Electric. They've got about two uh, addresses scheduled today, not every day, but they anticipate the next month is their schedule to get all the houses switched over um, to the new underground service. Um, uh, I did want to point out that uh, Facebook notifications for all council meetings will be going out. Um, just went ahead and, and took care of that when the agenda is approved. It will also go on to the Facebook event so that the public can be a little bit more informed. Uh, and then I wanted to point out there's a s emergency supplemental on the uh, agenda for tonight. I don't want to take anything out of Mr. Haynes' report. Uh, I just wanted to, to express that staff doesn't take that lightly. Uh, we wouldn't ask for an emergency um, supplemental with any waivers <coughs> or readings if it was any um, normal circumstance. The C Town Street uh, trunk sewer is not. Uh, that's about all I have as the administrator. If I put my utilities hat on, uh, there are two addresses, 28 and 30. Hardwood Drive. They are in the Southwest Licking uh, Water and Sewer Service Area. They do not have a water main in the area. We have a water main that runs right along the front of these properties. Um, Southwest Licking Board has denied service to those properties, uh, allowing us the ability to service them. Uh, it's not a, operationally, it is not a hindrance on us to serve water to these two houses at these properties. So, barring any uh, objection, uh, we'll be sending a letter back to, to the district so that we accepted water rights for those properties um, and going through the process there. Um, staffing, I've got two things. Ryan Brown is our plant superintendent. Uh, he notified me today that he will be leaving. His last day is March 6th. He's going to uh, Buckeye Lake to do great things there. So we'll start the uh, process of looking for his replacement. And Connor Johnson passed his uh, class one water EPA exam that means that the entire staff outside of the billing office, um, Connor and John uh, have some uh, hours they have to put in. They have to have a year's worth of service in, um, but they have all the exams are passed for everybody that, to have a class one water license, which is the highest license that you need to run our both of our water plants. Um, so pretty proud of him for getting that done. Uh, outside of that, I don't have anything else. Be happy to answer any questions. Do you anticipate the billing staff getting that license? I do not anticipate the billing staff being interested in the water chemistry right. exam. Any questions for Chris as far as uh, uh, city administrator goes or uh, utility department? Yes, sir. Yeah, quick question. You might know the answer to this. Um, have we heard back from the HVAC contractor at all time? Uh, so we have not heard back, especially they came out again this week, um, taking some more measurements. They found, uh, figured out the electric routing, how they're going to do it. No proposal yet. Last thing I've heard from them was about a week ago, and they were optimistic that our budget and the um, and the job would, would not be a problem. Uh, but this is this is for the air conditioning for the theater, yes, correct? Sir. That's all I have. Okay. Any other questions? You feeling a little lonely down there, Mr. Epperson? <laughs> Been used to it the past couple of weeks. Okay. All right. Thank you, Chris. Yes, sir. Mr. Nicholson. Well, uh, thank you very much, Mayor. Uh, you stole my thunder on the supplemental, so I'm good at that. You're, you're good at that. Um, we are uh, continuing to work towards year-end financial reporting. Uh, we will probably have auditors on site within the next two to three weeks. Uh, I would imagine you guys may be receiving uh, not the new members of council, but the existing members. Previous ones that were in place as of 1231, getting the annual letters from the auditors, uh, fraud and related party questionnaires. I'll get you guys a copy of the, the new members so you can see what uh, you'll receive from the auditors. Basically, they uh, they reach out to all the various parties uh, asking if you're aware of any uh, fraud, uh, misconduct, those types of things. It, it, it totally goes outside uh, of us. We give the addresses to our auditors. They mail the letters. Email them directly back to them. So it's just an independent kind of confirmation. 
Um, so those will be coming out probably within the next month or so. So uh, stay tuned to see those letters. And that's uh, all I have. Anything for Jamie? All right, I just want to thank you again for, uh, although I'm not allowed to campaign for the uh, police income tax, I can't ask you for questions. Uh, to answer my question, I'm happy to provide information, information so at any time. I'm trying to get it out to the residents uh, when they have questions or ask for numbers. Yep. I'm coming to you, and I do Absolutely. appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Yes. You know, I noticed there's a lot of confusion about what is actually on the ballot, um, and I don't know, Jamie, if there, we're doing anything to clarify that through our information. Um, I've heard tonight uh, police levy, you know, maybe you call it a police income tax, it's an income tax increase. And I, I just want to make sure that we're all clear about that. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I don't know how it is exactly posted on the city information. Is it? I, is my first question. I have nothing to do with that. Okay. So there's, I, and I've heard from numerous people uh, stating police levy. Mm -hmm. And um, I just wanted to make sure that um, as we talk about it, at least I'd ask that we're very clear about it. It's not a levy. It's not a. It's not a property tax uh, increase of any type. It's an income tax yep. uh, increase. So I just want to make sure we refer to it as that because that's what it is. Yes. All right. Thanks. Thank you. All right, Alan. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, first topic is the uh, Town Street Trunk Sewer. This is, of course, with the aforementioned uh, emergency supplemental. I did send out an email to Council on February 7th to give uh, details, including schedule and budget for that project. I uh, have conferred with Mr. Nicholson on the budget. Uh, and I had given in that email a, a graphic from his year-end report that did show that we did have uh, over $300,000 in savings in the 2019 budget. So we do have that covered for the requested amount, which is uh, $275,000. Uh, we've looked at that uh, cost estimate provided by the engineer in depth, the, uh, the design team did. Uh, pretty confident in that number as a worst case scenario with it uh, built in a number of contingencies I think we'll actually be able to get it done for uh, for less than that. <laughs> Along with that uh, resolution uh, 2020 this is for the contractor to go ahead and purchase the structures, uh, catch basins and manholes. Uh, that will allow those to uh, be fabricated ahead of the project. Uh, that will uh, That is the largest potential delay in the project that we've identified that we can uh, mitigate. Uh, so if we can go ahead and if, if we do um, the supplemental uh, pass that resolution, they can get those ordered, and that uh, will hopefully get us uh, digging by April. Uh, if we're lucky, I uh, intend to have a resolution to award the contract at the next council meeting uh, after getting numbers from the contractor. Uh, next item is uh, resolution 2020-016. Uh, this is for GPD Group to perform a safety study and to apply for ODOT safety funding. Uh, for the intersection of uh, Summit and Broad as coordinated with the uh, Streets Committee. Uh, GPD Group is the same that did the intersection safety and capacity study uh, per ODOT's recommendation. They thought we should go ahead and move forward with them. Uh, the safety study will look at the intersection of uh, Summit and Broad Street uh, much more in depth than the general study did, and it is a requirement for the ODOT safety funding. Uh, we did budget uh, $95,000 this year for engineering for the intersection improvements program. We're using some of that money to make this application to apply for that funding. Uh, sounds like ODOT funding is pretty ripe uh, right now for its safety funds, and there's a very good potential of getting funding for, uh, for this project. Uh, finally, resolution 2020-017. Uh, this is to authorize the bidding of the Taylor Road drainage project. Uh, that's the project we're running a new storm sewer down either side of Taylor Road from Berry Drive to about 800 feet south of Berry Drive, where we had uh, flooding of the intersection of Taylor Road and Berry Road. Uh, we budgeted 300000 for that project, and the uh, current cost estimates at 250000 so hopefully we'll see some savings on that project uh, once it is bid out. Happy to answer any questions. Anything for Alan? Yes. Alan, on the two ordinances you have for the, for the uh, Town Street, um, you, the $20,000 is just the ability to spend twenty of the two hundred and seventy-five that would be in the supplemental, correct? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Anything else for Alan? Thank you, sir. Scott? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, as we know, the comprehensive uh, plan workshop will be held on March 9th. A draft copy of the, of the plan is on your dais for review prior to that meeting. Also, this evening, Ms. Klima mentioned the spreadsheet that was emailed out to Council earlier, excuse me, last week. 
Um, that was included in my report, but looking at it on eight and a half by 11, it's a little small, so I tried to provide you a little bit larger version. That's on your dais. Also, following the distribution of my council report, I received a letter from Dr. Wagner outlining his thoughts on Sage Point. That was emailed to council last week, but a copy is also on your dais. And finally, the Country Time rezoning request. I received an email from Mr. Kuhn with Country Time requesting <coughs> that, that application, or excuse me, that ordinance be tabled this evening. Aside from that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Anything for Scott? All right, thank you, sir. Lanier? Thank you, Mayor. Um, first, I'd like to up update you guys on the Liberty Park Improvement Project. We did receive four quality bids on that on February 7th. Um, we're working with the engineering team now, and we're hopes to have a resolution to award on the March 2nd at our next meeting. Um, Parks Advisory Board update, since we are down um, a member. Um, Licking Heights had basically their recommendation on their agenda today. <coughs> I'm hoping at our next meeting we can have a, um, a motion to accept their recommendation. That way we'll be at full house at that point, um, beginning at our first meeting in March. Um, Hiring process for our seasonal maintenance employees is underway. Our last day for applicants for those two positions will be this Friday. I'm hoping to have those applicants interviewed and started by the end of March. Um, the pool applications will go on until March 20th and then we'll begin bringing in our aquatic team at that time. Um, lastly, the fee schedule. Um, it was tabled on the January 6th meeting um, with a lot of feedback at that meeting and also looking forward and working with the Parks Advisory Board on those fees. Um, we have now brought it back to you and we're asking that we can take it off the table so that we can begin to vote on that. That way the fees can um, go into effect at that time. And besides that, I'm open to any questions. Anything for Lanier? Okay, very good, sir. Chief Brooks? I have nothing tonight. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Anything for the Chief? Mm -hmm. All right. Any committee chair reports? Um, were you going to do one for us tonight? I think Mr. Epperson. Mr. Epperson? Um, with um, being the uh, councilman that was at the utilities meeting, I'll try to fill in on this. So okay. Okay. This is my first one. Very good. Um, we went over a few things. Um, the WRF upgrade um, to the sewer plant with the um, removal of the um, disc aeration system and the um, uh, installation of the jet aeration jet aeration system. <coughs> so, um, it was uh, briefed to us uh, as I find the paperwork here that um, uh, the, the plan is to get um, because at night the water levels go down uh, the discs aren't working on the water so when the water levels come up uh, it takes all day to keep that aeration going to feed the organisms that are inside there that kind of eat the sewage, for lack of a better word. Uh, the new generation system will work kind of like a fish tank, the lower end of the water, uh, it'll bubble through the water at all times depending on the water level. Um, so it's, um, as it's explained to me, is that correct, Chris? Yeah, that's all right. Um, uh, the um, oxidation uh, ditch equipment, um, the, the price is 335 um, point six thousand uh, dollars and then also a crane hoist system uh, for the jet aeration system um, going in and out of um, the water and it was explained to me that this will um, reduce uh, maintenance costs um, the electricity to run those discs um, is can be quite expensive the maintenance the man hours to service that system can be quite expensive so um, the jet aeration system upgrade uh, will uh, as my understanding, greatly reduce the um, maintenance expenses in the city. So, uh, we also discussed um, water tower upgrades, um, specifically the two in Beachwood Trails. Um, um, it is determined that, especially uh, water tower number two, if you're familiar with them, it's the one that has all the legs going around it, that's going to need to be completely stripped and recoded um, on the exterior. Uh, the other one, um, and beach for trails number one. Um, it doesn't need stripped, but it will need recoded. Is that yes. correct? Okay. Yes. Um, the price for that, and Chris will be a little more accurate on this. Um, uh, there's a couple ways that the, the city could approach this. Um, 
They could have it all done in one shot, um, taking care of both these towers and then another tower located, where was that other tower at? Uh, southeast tower at the waste park facility. Okay, um, which will be recoded as well. Um, uh, we've had one bid and um, it came in at just the one tower, um, number two in Beachway Trails is just under $1 million and that's not including the other two towers. Um, to have those recoded as well. Um, but there is another option, um, and I, the name uh, Suez Maintenance, they can offer a 10-year a plan um, at approximately 156500 uh, a year and where they will cover all the work on all three towers um, for just, what is it, $28,000 more than what the total bid for a one-time is. Um, however, with this one, we get emergency service uh, at any time during that 10 year process, um, which um, Chris may be able to elaborate as far as the cost savings um, based on that $28,000 investment. Um, they're looking, their plan, um, and the plan is flexible, my understanding, um, but in year five is when they would do the um, uh, extensive repairs on Beachwood too. Um, I asked Chris if he could, um, if he's not familiar with the total cost of what a new tower would be, um, he looked into it, and um, what was the total for a new tower if one was to be put in? Right around 1.3 for the tower itself, and you've still got the coatings to put on, and, and the, you know, any incidentals that you find when you're hooking up the plumbing and, and going up to the, okay. the tower. So that just, uh, for me, uh, to, to give me kind of an idea of if the uh, maintenance investment it was worth the uh, expense. Um, I will kick this over. Chris to cover anything I may have missed uh, with regards to uh, well drilling maintenance and um, uh, the other water line running on, um, I forget the name of the road, yeah. I apologize. Yes, Jeff. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Epson. Uh, just to to hit a couple things, the, the wastewater plant upgrade, we're still waiting for the EPA to finish their investigation, their uh, evaluation of our PTI that is coming to a close finally. Uh, they have not had another turnover round, so we are, we're getting close to approval for that. Uh, GPD group, the INI uh, program, an update on that, they've, they've compiled the, the existing videos that we have, and they are analyzing them and syncing them up actually to a GIS map, so we'll be able to see on the map where our worst infiltration zones are. Um, we did discuss uh, purchasing two um, new trucks for the utility department, they're in the budget uh, for this year. Uh, we are waiting to hear back on a, on a quote for the second truck before we bring them to council's resolutions. Those will be purchased off the state bid website. Uh, we also discussed <coughs> Jefferson Street water line um, upsized from a six inch to an eight inch. Um, the budget model for that is to do that work next year. So this year we'll have to get the engineering done. Um, and so that will the engineering itself will be at a, a dollar amount that will have to come to council as a resolution with that. So it's more of a heads up. Um, the well cleaning program for 2020, water plant two is due this year to get the wells clean. There are two of them over there. Uh, we have received two quotes for that. We're waiting on a third quote before we evaluate um, and decide who we would like to go with. That will also come to council in resolution form. Um, and then the, the big one, the water tower, uh, painting program, uh, as Mr. Upson expressed, getting quotes for just painting the towers one time, coming in, painting them, and moving on, came in a total of about $1.537 million. Um, an example of a maintenance plan over 10 years where they'll, they'll paint the towers inside and out, um, an annual visual inspection, and any emergency services uh, that need done, any leaks or, or anything like that, will all be in all inclusive and that came in at 1.56 million that's the difference of twenty eight thousand dollars between those two um, estimates so that that warranted a lot of uh, value in my mind so what, what we did was we advertised an RFP for any other companies that may offer this same type of 10-year all-inclusive maintenance plan and uh, that that's going to run for a few more weeks and then we'll evaluate um, the proposed the prices and proposals that we get for this type of a service and uh, bring that back to council um, moving forward from there and I believe that was everything we covered it was a, it was a busy night but uh, I think that's all of it
these local companies are these local companies that would could, could supply us with the emergency <coughs> service? Uh, they are in the state of Ohio, but they are up north. They're up by Ag the, the the one company that I've talked to. So we'll see who who comes in with the RFP process, which is the benefit of doing that. Any questions for that utility report? Thank you, Mr. Epperson. Nice job. Humble my way through that. <laughs> uh, any other committee chair reports? <clears throat> All right, on to unfinished business. Chair, I have a point of order. Yes. I need to ask Mr. Fulton something. Mr. Fulton, you said that some applicant had asked to table an ordinance, and I believe you said country time, but I think country time was here. I didn't hear if that gentleman asked to table. It's on the uh, the email that's on your dais that I printed out, ordinance 2019-4356. Okay. Just want to make sure. Mm -hmm. We'd rather not table. It sounds like, it, unless there's. Okay, sorry. We got you. Okay. All right. Unfinished business. Uh, we're leaving forty-three forty-one on the table. That's one where Mr. Yes. Mr. Fulton again. That forty-three forty-one. That's the request of that applicant to put that on the table. Is that my understanding? No. No. It's Beachwood Trails. This is this is scenic view estates. We we met it today to discuss. No, I'm talking about forty-three forty-one. Excuse me, point of order, 4341. Is that the, is the applicant for under that asking this to asking that to remain on the table? We and I was gonna say we met today to discuss that. There's still some outstanding concerns that they need to address. Okay. So they didn't formally say yes, leave it on the table, but I think that's in the best interest. Okay. It'd be your, your department's recommendation. That's correct. Thank you, Mr. I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor. Well, 4341 is for middle ground, which is the Beachwood Trails issue. It has nothing to do with scenic view of states. Right. It has nothing to do with country time. No, I, okay. I, I wanted to clarify, okay. Very good. gentlemen, again, to, to, for the record's clear, the gentleman from Country Time is here. He spoke to us for five minutes. He didn't say anything about tabling. That's why I asked to make sure that Mr. Fulton had not spoken. There are a number of applications on the agenda this evening. I want to make sure that that was cleared up. And I appreciate Mr. Fulton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Any interest in taking Ordinance 2019-4357 off the table? Uh, Mr. Mayor? Yes. I move we take uh, 4357 off the table. Got a motion? I'll second. second. Seconded by Mr. Walther. Discussion? And roll. Walther? Yes. Epperson? Yes. Barstow? Yes. Campshire? Yes. Lee? Yes. Okay, so ordinance 2019-4357 for a third reading. So moved. Moved by Mr. Barstow. Second. Seconded by Mr. Walther. Jess, when you're ready, please. Mm -hmm. Ordinance 2019-4357 for a third reading. An ordinance to amend the City of Pataskill schedule of municipal fees and thereby add Section D, Parks and Recreation. You have an update for us, Mr. Crawford? I can give you a simple update as to what we did. Um, previously, we did not add anything in there for our local groups. Um, with the recommendation by some of our council members in on January 6th, Essentially, um, as a group, from Park Advisory Board and myself, we <laughs> gave a 20%, a, a um, I guess, discounted rate for the, our local leagues, just to make sure we we're still, still fair um, to everyone in the league, but we also still want, wanted to keep our issues at a forefront, and those issues were continual upgrades to our facilities with the lack of funding coming in yearly, so we still want to make sure that we are properly bringing in the funds to recover our costs and also to continuously um, build our build our facilities into the state-of-the-art facilities that we actually want to provide for our community. So, I have a question. Yes, sir. Before we get into discussion with the rest of the council members, um, has this ordinance been changed in any way? Amended in any way? Written, changed? Or is it the same ordinance? It's been changed. Okay. Yes. So we're going to have to. Well, actually, well, so that, that's my question. I get, I get very confused with this. When before it was tabled, Section D had some parks and rec schedule, had fees in there. It, that can't change unless council asks for that section to be. I mean, so it was written and then it was tabled. Are you requesting that be changed in some way? Because council would have to amend the piece of legislation to make those changes. And then have actually another reading. Right. That, yeah. that, that's what I, yeah. that's what I was getting ready to do. I think Mr. Walter, we're going to have to um, <coughs> All right. Okay. And then by or by substitution, however you want to yeah. phrase it. I'll yeah. let Mr. Walter. Well, I want to I want to 
Yeah, let's, 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 go, let's go into discussion phase and then yeah, permit. Go ahead. Yep. So I do have a question there. Okay. Um, in, in the discussions that you've had at the park board, um, you talked about uh, also not only giving a, or pr proposing a discount for the local groups, but also um, delaying those fees until after July 1st, I believe? They will go into effect July 1st, basically for our fall season, yes. Okay. So in your, bu so there's a follow-up question to that. In your budget, uh, proposed budget, you had some um, uh, improvements to the ball diamonds and using using some funds mm -hmm. to uh, that you had anticipated coming in from those fees being increased, correct? Yes. So are the are the uh, participants that may be using these ball diamonds understanding that we will not do, or at least I'm I'm assuming we will not do any of those improvements that were proposed until after those fees start coming in. Obviously, half the fees will come in this year. Yes. So potentially half or even less than half of the improvements that you had proposed in your budget would be made, correct? Yes, the, the organizations are aware. Um, a lot of that was brought up, especially when we met after our meeting um, January 6th. Okay, and I just wanted to make clear for us, budget-wise, um, that we're not going to spend you know, the, the fees that we didn't get. If we, if we have proposed to pro postpone this, then obviously we don't have the monies to spend on that. And I'm hopeful that that's in maybe a corrected budget in your own, in, yeah. not necessarily in a, in a um, formal budget to us, but at least we know that we're not going to spend that this year. There's only a minor minor project we'll have to do just with a fence falling or a tree falling on the fence, but outside of that, we're there'll not be no, gonna, There'll be no other projects. No other projects on the baseball facilities make sure we're this clear. year. Okay, thanks, Lee. Any other discussion? Okay. I'd like to make a motion to amend Section D as pro provided in our, uh, in our information this evening. Got a motion to amend? Second. Seconded by Mr. Barstow. Discussion? And roll on the motion to amend. Barstow? Yes. Hampshire? Yes. Lee? Yes. Wolfer? Yes. Everson? Yes. <coughs> motion to amend passes, and then this has to go to a fourth reading, so we're done on that for tonight. <coughs> Ordinance 2019-4354 for a third reading. So moved. Moved by Mr. Barstow. Second. Seconded by Mr. Walter. Jess, when you're ready. Ordinance 2019-4354, third reading. Ordinance to rezone property located at 6031 Summit Road Southwest, parcel number 063-141474-00.000. Totaling plus or minus 84.30 acres in the city of Chaska from medium low density residential R87 zoning cl classification to planned development district PDD zoning cl classification. Discussion? Yes, sir. Um, Scott, I just wanted to ask a quick question. You know, we, we've looked at this a few times, have heard a lot of information about this. Um, one of the items within the legislation re legislative report is that. Uh, the, comp the current comprehensive plan, not the draft comprehensive plan, but the current comprehensive plan recommends uh, a 2.17 unit uh, density, mm -hmm. and that's what is being proposed now, correct? That's the density, correct. That's the density proposed. being correct. Okay. And then, as far as um, the letter that we received from, from the school district, mm -hmm. um, they really didn't take a position one way or the other on the development itself. Basically, they were clarifying that the school was not anticipating putting a space um, garage at, at the Cleveland Ave Avenue site, is that correct? The is that your understanding? Yeah, th throughout this process, it's always been communicated to myself that their intent was to do a bus garage. So we based moving forward that it would be a bus garage. So this is the first that I saw that were other considerations for the property. They never said we absolutely will do a bus garage, but that's our intent at this point. And with this uh, um, PUDD, um, are we zoning that 10 acres for a bus garage? Is that what's being proposed? Um, that would be included in the rezoning. However, their development text originally in March, it indicated um, something about the schools and their development text and this 10 acres being de dedicated to the schools. Since March, it's been completely omitted from their development text. So there was no indication of what would be there when they came in September or November, and that was one of staff comments that we need to address this moving forward, at least have some idea what could be in there. So just 
last question on that item. So if the school wanted to build a bus garage there, there's nothing here that's saying that they can. Is correct. That correct. They correct. would have to come in to do zoning essentially for that because the PDD did not allow for it. Correct. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion? I just point order just for the record to show that I'm still refused on this ordinance. All right, very good. Yes, sir. Yeah, a couple things. Um, I have, I've <coughs> spoken with Dr. Wagner personally about the um, about the ten acres that we're all discussing, and um, he has, you know, said the same thing that we would he, they would have to come back for whatever they did, um, no matter what it was. Um, my my holdup's really not that ten acres. Um, I share some of the same concerns that the people that have got out there and spoke. And, um, I do also realize that Fisher's gone back and, and made an attempt here to, to try and meet some of our design standards. So. I guess what I'm saying is I know there's a lot of people that, that aren't in favor of us tabling it, but they have requested that. And the only the, the reason I would consider a table um, is just if they're willing to go back and look at some of the traffic concerns that were brought up and also improve the product, I'd be willing to listen to that. Um, so I just want to put out there for the point of discussion that I would be willing to entertain a table if, it was, if that was council's pleasure. But I do understand why the residents and any other discussion? Hang on. Any, any, anything? Before I go back around again? Okay. <coughs> Mr. Walter? Uh, I'm uh, in agreement with Tom about uh, uh, the idea of going back to the planning and zoning for a couple different reasons. One, um, one, of, the, one of the things we heard tonight <coughs> was from the expert from Granville about uh, cluster homing, cluster, cluster uh, type developments. Um, I think that if they're willing to improve the uh, the layout, if they're willing to uh, address some of the um, design standards that we're looking at, um, and again, this is consistent with the existing comprehensive plan, which was you know passed um, uh, previously. Um, I'm going to bring up another point that you know they're they're obligating to fix storm uh, issues in the area. Um, you know I, I think that it's worth looking at further. For that reason, um, and I would be in favor of putting this on the table or putting it uh, a table here. Mr. Yes, Mr. Marshall. I'm not in favor of this ordinance. I don't care whether it goes back to planning and zoning or not. I'm not in favor. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Yeah, I just wanted to add that, that um, just, just for everyone out there, that whether we vote yay or nay on a, on a table doesn't mean we're for or against the project. So I just wanted to be clear. Uh, the gentleman of the Couple people that spoke um, about Summit Road, I think over there, we hear you. Um, that is a, that is an issue, and, and we hear that loud. And it's not directly related to this ordinance, but we hear those concerns. Okay. Any other discussion? Yes. I'm going to make a motion to table this ordinance uh, 2019-4354. Got a motion to table? I'll second that. You got a second? Discussion? And roll. Lee? Yes. Walter? Yes. Epperson? Barstow? He's, 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 yeah, he's recused. Barstow? No. Hampshire? Yes. Okay. Ordinance is tabled. Ordinance 2019-4355 for a third read. So moved. Moved by Mr. Barstow. Second. Seconded by Mr. Walter. Just when you're ready. <coughs> third reading. Ordinance 2019-4355 for a third reading. An ordinance creating, establishing, and adopting Chapter 1296 Residential Appearance Standards of the Codified Ordinances of the City of Potosco. Discussion? Yes. Aaron, but Scott, um, in the BIA uh, letter that we received back in January 17th, um, in looking through that, item number four uh, was something that I was interested in, in getting your opinion on. Um, you know, when we were going through the dis these design standards, we had wanted to um, um, alleviate the essentially snub the stub nose or the the nosed uh, type of garage that sticks out in front of of the um, house, uh, the main part of the building. Um, in their point that they talk about with um, you know, using the, the um, patio area as, as assessing that as part of the living space, essentially. Um, looking at that, that seemed to be at least a reasonable um, request uh, in amending our, 
our uh, design standards that we've put together so far has that even if you do use the, the porch as your, your, your starting line essentially, where you go four feet behind, we're still avoiding that, that snub nose looking uh, type house, which would what we wanted to avoid. And I think the BIA would even agree that those types of houses are, are um, maybe not as, as uh, desired. Is that your opinion, or what would be your opinion on number four? So the, the intent, the way the, the ordinance is written is that the garage <coughs> must be clearly secondary to the house. So the house is the focal point. So with you were referring to snout houses, where basically all you see is the garage and then the house is behind it. So that's what these were designed to avoid. So the way they're written is the livable area, so you can't consider the porch, which is required. So the livable area is essentially where your front door is back. So the way this is written, is the garage would have to be recessed at least four feet from the wall with your front door. So if we were to use the porch as the basis for the front of the house, the wall with your front door and the front of the garage could be equal. So essentially that puts them on a common ground. So we're not saying that the garage is, um, is primary, we're not saying it's secondary, essentially it puts them on a level playing field of like a net zero. So the front of your house can be the same level as the front of your garage. Okay. Okay. And in, in your opinion, do you think that, well, <coughs> you know, you've obviously looked at these design standards mm -hmm. a lot um, and put them together for us. In your opinion, do you think that this is a large uh, concession to the BIA? Or would this seem to make some sense if we're accomplishing uh, the same thing to avoid this uh, uh, prominent garage area? I don't think it would be problematic if, if this were to be amended. Okay. Any other discussion on this ordinance? Something else? Okay. Mr. Barstow, do you have any discussion on this ordinance? I don't know why we uh, kowtow to the BIA or these builders. Um, if we don't do exactly what they want, they just sue us. So that's what I have to say. Okay. Any other discussion? <coughs> yeah, I'd like to make a motion to amend the uh, uh, building uh, or the design standards uh, to allow for the front loaded garages uh, to be located uh, a minimum of four feet behind. Uh, the, uh, the porch, uh, for the porch to be evaluated um, as the um, uh, considered to be a livable area of the house. I'll second that for the discussion. <coughs> and a motion to amend, seconded by Mr. Lee. Uh, discussion? I, I just want to, I'm not or against that, I, I, I want to understand that better. I, I don't, I was comfortable with what we had, but if there's, I'm with, I'm with Mr. Barstow, I, you know, the, the BAI has been here and stated their case and we see their letter, that doesn't hold a lot of weight for me personally either, but I want to understand exactly that point to make sure that we don't need to look at that, or maybe we look at that later. Um, I'm I just want to understand it more before we move forward. Do you want me to explain the, yeah. the concept again? Yes, please. So if we, I wish I had a big white for me to draw. Um, so if we consider, right now the porch, everybody is required to have a minimum front porch. I think it's minimum 10 square feet front porch. So that is not considered livable area. So if you go up your front porch and to your front door, that wall back is considered the first point of livable area. If you take, that wall, you know, off the back of the porch and go four feet back, that's where your garage could first start. So that's what's required in this ordinance now. So it was designed to get away from essentially what's termed snout houses where the garage extends, you know, 15 feet out in front of the livable area of the house. So what Mr. Walter is proposing is to allow the porch to be considered the first part of livable area 
garage would be recessed at least four feet behind that, and then the where your front door of that wall and the garage can be equal, so it's a net zero. If you don't I, I, yeah. I, I, yeah, so what I'm looking, what I, what I, if you go out and look at some of the, the houses, um, you know, decent, good houses, um, some of the uh, front garage, uh, if you think about the roof line, the soffit area, um, those can line up with the porch overhang, essentially. The way we've got it set up, the porch would be in front of that. And so you get these, these uh, essentially bump outs for the porch, rather, or, or patio or wherever it might be, rather than them allowed to be uh, able to be essentially equal. Is that fair to say? And, and, and I want to just say one other thing. You know, Todd, I, I, I'm not uh, you know, saying anything that we should give in to the BIA in any way, shape, or form. I think there are many items that they don't like about these design standards. Um, this is something to give uh, potentially a little bit more architectural um, uh, ability for these guys to design something that looks good versus something that has the garage set back from where the porch would be. That's all I'm, that's all I'm suggesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if this was amended, it would have to go back down. It would. Yeah, um, Yeah. I, I appreciate the feedback and input, but I, I'm good with it the way it is. Any other discussion? No, I agree. I mean, I think it, it, the intent was to have the particular look. Um, otherwise, if I'm clear, you start getting more colonial, probably. Just all straight face across the front with a little bit of concrete on the front, call it a porch. So it just depends on what your preference to see out there. I want to have the discussion to make sure, but I'm comfortable with it. <laughs> OK, so we had a motion to amend, and it's been seconded. We have to vote on the motion to amend first. So. Jess, roll please. Walter? Yes. Epperson? No. Barstow? No. Hampshire? <coughs> no. Lee? No. Okay. Motion to amend fails. Uh, back to the original ordinance. Uh, any discussion? Final discussion? Mr. Mayor? Yes. Yeah, I move we adopt ordinance 2019 4355. Got a motion to adopt. Second. You need a second. Seconded by Mr. Lee. Discussion? And roll. Walter? Yes. Epperson? Yes. Barstow? Yes. Hampshire? Yes. Lee? Yes. Okay, ordinance passes. Ordinance 2019-4356 for a third reading. So moved. Moved by Mr. Barstow. Second. Seconded by Mr. Lee. Jess, when you're ready. Ordinance 2019-4356 for a third reading. An ordinance to rezone property located at 10530 Mill Street Road, Southwest Parcel Number 064-152880-00.000, totaling 21.42 plus or minus acres in the city of Pataskwa from the Agricultural AG zoning classification to the medium low density residential R87 zoning classification. Discussion? Mr. Mayor, I'm going to have to recuse on this one as well. Okay. Let the record show Mr. Epperson is recusing himself. Discussion? Uh, yeah, I'll go. Um, so um, I try not to be long winded here, but I feel that everybody in the room deserves my explanation on being that it's Ward 1 and not some Ward that I represent. Um, this has been one of the toughest, toughest ones for me. Um, one of the toughest votes on council. Um, I've gotten to speak with a lot of you and got to know some of you, some of you I've known for years. And um, it's tough for me because um, I believe very strongly in um, that I'm the voice of, of my ward and the people that, that live in it. And I also have sat here on council and denied cluster housing because I'm in favor of bigger, homes on you know bigger lots um, so I guess where I stand on this is I feel that the voice what the impact or I'm sorry the input that I get back from the residents is more important than my personal opinion and my vote will reflect what the residents have come to me with so that's how I will reflect my vote any other discussion yes sir, yes, sir. yeah you know this this not, not my ward, um, but I certainly know where this area of the city is, and I've had the privilege of being going all over the city and talking to residents over the last several years and even 
one of the biggest topics that I have is there's a drainage problem in my neighborhood um, of, of some of some type. Um, farmland that drains onto my lawn, um, a culvert that doesn't function properly, or what have you. There's all kinds of things. A, a, a retention pond that drains across my backyard and floods it every time it rains. There's all sorts of stripes in all parts of the city. So I, I, I just have, I have some hesitation about this, uh, considering the, the soil, soil and water um, representative who came and spoke. I just have some issues. I just have some lingering doubts about whether or not this is a, a good idea um, or not. It's the type of house, it's the, it's the size of lot um, that I have uh, I've been advocating for um, for a number of years, so that uh, pulls me in one direction, but just have some lingering concerns about the drainage issues, and so I'll, I'll listen to other council members and their, their thoughts. Thank you. Merrick, you know, obviously this was a 3-3 tie at planning and zoning. Um, so it was a difficult discussion and decision for that board. Uh, you know, I respect that board uh, very much. I've been to several of their meetings and listened to them, um, you know, walk through and discuss all the issues that are in front of them, um, whether it be traffic or drainage or soil types. Um, you know, what, what I look at on this street is that there are many houses that are uh, lotted to this size. Uh, throughout the area on both sides of the road. Um, many of those uh, residents I know love their houses and love being at those houses. Um, we've heard from uh, a gentleman that has been to more meetings than I can count uh, applying for um, uh, to be a part of the city's process. Uh, and, he, and he actually, as I understood it, said, you know, this would be something that he would enjoy. Um, um, purchasing and living at and being a part of. Uh, another person obviously stated the same thing uh, during tonight's um, reading, or tonight's uh, citizens' comments. The issues that, that I guess I see, um, and I agree with Tommy that, that uh, you know, I live in the area. Uh, I know of the, uh, the type of soils that are in the area. I know of the farming that's in the area. Um, at the same time, um, you know, I know that, that uh, my 10 acres or the next person's 10 acres or the next person's 10 acres could all be deemed to be insufficient or, or not, uh, um, or adding some kind of uh, bad drainage <coughs> or taking up some kind of farmland. So um, I have a real problem uh, telling somebody that they can't, uh, you know, subdivide to um, a reasonable size of properties uh, to provide uh, for citizens, for future citizens of um, Pataskala, uh, what we have been up here talking about um, being able to provide. So uh, those are my thoughts on it. Any other discussion? You're out, right? Okay. <coughs> What's uh, council's pleasure? Hang on, Jeff. Call the roll. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. we well, a motion to adopt. Right? Yeah. We need a motion to adopt. We need a motion to adopt. I'll make the motion to adopt. Okay, we got a motion to adopt. Need a second? Second. Seconded by Mr. Barstow. Discussion and roll. Barstow. Yes. Hampshire. No. Lee. No. Walter. Yes. Yep, two, two, five. Aye. Yep, two, two. No. Broke the tie there. All right. Ordinance fails. Ordinance 2020-4358 for a second reading. So moved. Second. Moved by Mr. Barstow, seconded by Mr. Epperson. Jess, when you're ready. Ordinance 2020-4358 for a second reading. An ordinance creating, establishing, and adopting Chapter 1223 Distressed Property of the Codified Ordinances of the City of Pataxi. Discussion? Okay, on to new business. 
Ordinance 2020-4359 for a first reading. So moved. Second. Moved by Mr. Barstead, seconded by Mr. Epperson. Jess, when you're ready. Ordinance 2020-4359 for a first reading. An ordinance to amend Chapter 1287, Off-Site Impact, of the codified ordinances of the City of Tesla and repeal all other ordinances and parts of the ordinance in conflict herewith. Discussion? Okay, Ordinance 2020-4361 for a first reading. So moved. Moved by Mr. Barstow. Second. Seconded by Mr. Lee. Yes, when you're ready. First reading. Ordinance 2020-4361 for a first reading. An ordinance to make supplemental appropriations for current expenses and other expenditures during the fiscal <coughs> year ending December 31st, 2020 and declaring an emergency. Mr. Mayor? Yes. Uh, as to ordinance, this is discussion. As to ordinance discussion phase. Go ahead. As to ordinance 2020-4361. I move that we dispense with the readings on three separate dates as provided for in section 4.04 of the Charter of City of Pasco and declare an emergency. Got a motion to dispense Second. with the reading. Seconded by Mr. Walther. Discussion on the motion to dispense with the readings. Yes, when you're ready. Mm -hmm. Walther? Yes. Epperson? <coughs> yes. Barstow? Yes. Hampshire? Yes. Lee? Yes. Okay, back to the reading. Mr. Barstow. Mr. Mayor, I move that we adopt uh, Ordinance 2020-4361. Got a motion to adopt. Second. Second. Seconded by Mr. Epperson. Discussion and roll. Epperson? Yes. Barstow? Yes. Hampshire? Yes. Lee? Yes. Walther? Yes. Ordinance passes. On to resolutions. <coughs> Resolution 2020-015, resolution authorizing and directing the city administrator to execute a contract with Spenco Excavating Inc to procure <coughs> materials for the Town Street Trunk Sewer Project. So moved. Second. Moved by Mr. Walther, seconded by Mr. Uh, Barstow. Uh, discussion? Just, the resolution here on our agenda says it to execute a contact, I think it means contract. Right? Contract. Okay. <coughs> Hopefully I said contract, didn't I? It says contact on our on the agenda. Oh, I said contract. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, very good. Sorry. So let me understand this. They have to custom make pieces. They don't have these kind of pieces already in stock. So the core drill for the holes, it's a lot easier to have those done when they're fabricated. Uh, we, can, we can get blanks and core drill them on site, or we can get ones that are already manufactured with the holes in them. That's much easier for the contractor, so it saves time and money on site. So but it takes more time for them to make them? It takes a little bit more time for them to make them. Okay. All right, any other discussion? Yeah, yeah, just so you know, I would highly suggest that we we go ahead and order these per what the plan will be, so that they're at the right elevation and the right size. It'll fit much better. They'll they'll last a lot longer. Realize that. I, I just when when he was discussing it, he said it was going to take you know they were going to be custom made. I was like, okay, I want that understood. So, all right, thank you. Uh, any other discussion? Jess, when you're ready. <coughs> Barstow. Yes. Hampshire. Yes. Lee. Yes. Walther. Yes. Jefferson? Yes. Resolution passes. Resolution 2020-016. Resolution authorizing and directing the city administrators to execute contract with Gloss, Pyle, Schomer, Burns, and DeHaven, Inc., GPD Group, to perform a safety study and to assemb assemble and submit a highway safety improvement program application to the Department of Ohio Transportation on the city's behalf for the funding improvements to the intersection of Broad Street and Summit Road. So moved. Second. Moved by Mr. <coughs> Barstow and seconded by Mr. Epperson. Discussion and roll. Hampshire? <coughs> yes. Lee? Yes. Walther? Yes. Epperson? Yes. Barstow? Yes. Resolution passes. Resolution 2020-017. A resolution authorizing and directing the city administrator to advertise, receive, and review bids for construction of the Taylor Road Storm Sewer Improvement Project. So moved. Moved by Mr. Barstow. Second. Second by Mr. Epperson. Discussion? And roll. Lee? Yes. Walther? Yes. Epperson? Yes. Barstow? Yes. Hampshire? Yes. Okay, on the motions. I think we had somebody Mr. request Mr. a motion. Mayor. Yes, sir. Mr. Mayor, um, I'm looking for a motion for council for to, to fill the vacancy for the planning and zoning commission. Yeah. 
quoting anybody. You're just I'm looking not, for a I'm motion. Not, but anybody have okay. a motion? I'm not, I'm not going to make a motion. I'll, I'll make a motion to put Mr. Cook on there. Is that the one you wanted? No. no I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Let me let me say this again. Let me let me. I'm looking for a motion. Sorry, Mr. He's just looking for a motion. I'm looking for a motion for the planning for some placement in the planning and zoning commission during the mind that Mr. Cook, who was here, expressed a preference for the board of zoning appeals, which is coming up next. I'll just so, I'll just so maybe I won't. Just just one here. second. <laughs> Ask again for a second. Yeah, we have a. Ask. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, second on the planning and zoning, we, we had. Mr. Lee has withdrawn his nomination of Mr. Yes, Cook. I have. Yes. Okay, we have a, any other uh, nominations for the Planning and Zoning Commission? Right. Once, going to try to three times. Looking for a motion to fill the vacancy on the Board of Zoning Appeals. Uh, Mr. Walter. I'm going to make a motion to, uh, to uh, have Mr. Cook uh, for the uh, BZA. Mr. Second. Cook, second by Mr. Epperson. Any discussion on that? Jess, when you're ready, call the roll, please. Lee? Yes. Walther? Yes. Epperson? Yes. Barstow? Yes. Hampshire? Yes. Congratulations, Mr. Cook. You're the newest member of the BZA. You're still here. There he is. I can't see him. Okay. Work on getting the, um, that, that's when the city council function out to, to get the new um, efforts out for the planning zone. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Walther, I'd like to make a motion to allow the um, um, gates to be open at Foundation Park during the Pataskalai Easter Egg Hunt. Uh, those gates would be opened and closed by the Citizen Patrol and the uh, de or the uh, off-duty policemen would be responsible for that. Can a motion? Second. Second by Mr. Barstow. Discussion? And roll. Walther? Yes. Everson? Yes. Barstow? Yes. Hampshire? Yes. Yes. All right. Any other motions? On to additional citizens' comments. Anybody wish to speak? I need your name and address. You have three minutes, and it needs to be about a topic that we discussed tonight. Anybody wish to speak? Yes, ma'am. First of all, I don't know why I commented in the beginning that I was commenting on a 10-acre site when I know it's not 10 acres, it's 21 plus acres. So I just wanted to put that there for the record that I spoke an error there. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor, for being the tiebreaker. And um, I appreciate everyone's input. I wanted to add that I understand the dilemma that we faced here tonight for the Mill Street project. Um, in the future, as Mr. Walter brought up with the new BZA member, the, the conflict with small properties versus large properties, of course, we would all dream of having large properties in Pataskala, and that would be all that we would have. I voted for, for large developments. I voted against large developments. I voted for um, cluster developments. I voted against them. I understand the process. Uh, I would just, in the future, um, consider the entire, the, the, as, as a, what, I'm sorry, what was your name, the new BZA? Cook. Mr. Cook um, said it's a case by case basis. You really can't lump everything into one, you know, idea that the, um, the Mill Street being kind of a unique street in our city uh, compared to another road that has nothing on it but farmland. So, you know, I know you guys have said a, a lot of no's to development. And I understand. I just want you to know that. I feel your pain. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else wish to speak? I believe a map was briefly displayed 
Sir, would you please yeah. state your name and your address? Oh, John yeah. Holman, 11,015 Mill Street. Thank you. I believe a map was briefly displayed uh, earlier this evening uh, from the former Lima Township, which uh, ceased to be in, uh, well, 25 years ago. Uh, this map uh, had a designation of agricultural land and vacant land, all uh, amassed in red. I think such an, a mixing of agricultural land and vacant land is an extreme insult to our ancestors and the ancestors of the original uh, uh, families in Pataskla uh, who labored by hand to convert the wooded swamp, which was Pataskla, into agricultural land. So that's my only comment. Out of respect to the history to uh, the forebears of our community going back to the 1850s. Thank you. Anybody else wish to speak? No. All right. What do you got for me, Mr. Barker? Uh, Mr. Mr. Mayor, we, we go into executive session pursuant <coughs> to higher wise code section 121.22G4 to review negotiations or bargaining sessions with public employees considering the compensation or other terms and conditions of their employment. Invited into this session are Chris Chirac, Brian Zetz, Jeff Stankunis, Jamie Nicholson, Bruce Brooks, and Mike Bowles. Got a motion to go to the executive session. Yes, sir. Uh, I'd like to uh, ask that uh, Deputy Bowles not be included in this uh, meeting I, I, for, for several reasons. Okay, well, he's not here anyway. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, we have, well, I just need a second of the motion then. Second. Right. Second by Mr. Lee. Discussion? And roll. Walter? Yes. Epperson? Yes. Barstow? Yes. Amshire? Yes. Lee? Yes. Okay, next session at 9.32. Can, can, can I state for the record that I will not be able to attend? I have to get back to work. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. 9.32 upstairs, folks. Good night. Good night. Okay, I'm sorry. Who, who did the motion? And who's Barstow and Epperson. Everson? Yes. Barstow? Yes. Hampshire? Yes. Lee? Okay, hey, out of executive yes. session at 949, we'll go around the room. Jude, what do you got? Anything for us? Uh, no, I was just pretty impressed with how many people were here and how long they stayed. Yeah. It was pretty nice. A good, a good group um, with very... You know, <coughs> I like it when we have a full house, and they're very respectful tonight, too. So I did, I did enjoy that. Anything else, Mr. Walter? I just wanted to echo uh, Sarah with the uh, Easter egg hunt, the challenge to donate some some uh, candy or some uh, some uh, toys or gift cards. I think that's a great idea. Um, you know, there's uh, if if you have a chance to be out there, it's literally three thousand kids that couldn't have a better day. So. Um, it's a great opportunity to to uh, give give some candies to, to uh, a good cause. So that's all. Mr. Zetz, I have nothing. Mr. Barstow, um, the Leeds flyer is uh, on your desk. If you get a chance to go, to Leeds is our our, is our local uh, assistance agency, and uh, early voting starts tomorrow. And that will be over at the courthouse and uh, we'll walk across the street and vote. That's it. Mr. Epperson, nothing. Sir. All right, I'll entertain a motion to so adjourn. Moved. Second moved by Mr. Barstow, second by Mr. Walter. Discussion and roll. Barstow. Yes. Hampshire. Yes. Lee. Walter. Yes. Epperson. Yes. Meeting adjourned. Yes, please.